morning and welcome everyone to the second meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2021. I can ask everyone to turn their mobile phones to silent for the duration of the meeting so that they don't interrupt. Um, we may be interrupted by a fire alarm in the Parliament building today, but we'll endeavour to keep going through that. And apologies to members who are, are in the Parliament today. Um, and we have also received a uh, late apology from uh, Ian Gray, uh, and there is no substitute for Mr Gray at committee this morning. Um, if we could move to agenda item one, which is to decide to take agenda items three and four in private, do any of the members object? Thank you very much. That's agreed. Um, and um, can we now move to our main agenda item, which is our panels on the additional support for learning review. Um, can I ask all members if they wish to ask a question or any of the panel members who wish to contribute, please put an R in the chat and we'll endeavour to make sure that everyone gets in who wants to. Um, uh, this is an evidence session on the additional support for learning review, also known as the Morgan Report. And the committee is due to hear from two witness panels today. Our first panel is Eileen Pryor, Executive De Director of Connect, Andrea Bradley, Assistant Secretary of the EIS, Ken Muir, Chief Executive of the General Teaching Council for Scotland, and Cheryl Burnett, Co-Vice Chair of the National Parent Forum for Scotland. And we're going to move straight to questions from our members. And can I invite Mr Gibson to open questions? Much convener. Uh, good morning, panel. Um, the review stated that, and I quote, unfortunately, we cannot assume that all teachers are signed up to the principles of inclusion and the presumption of mainstreaming. But surely this is because many teachers have experience of children with needs that do not come with adequate support. The result is presenteeism rather than participation on occasion, with this presumption that the teacher will just go on with it regardless of the impact on the child or other pupils in the class. Is it not dishonest to pretend to parents that their ASN child will get an education without that support? So, for example, say a teacher has asked the class to participate in a discursive essay about school uniforms. A severe ASN child with support might draw someone in a school uniform, leaving the teacher to teach the rest of the class. But without a classroom assistant, for example, to do that, how will such a person participate in the work of the class? Um, does the panel agree that without support, children um, with the ASN can effectively be excluded rather than included, even while in the classroom? Okay, um, I'm looking to panel members to indicate they want to come in by putting an R in the chat. Does anyone want to respond? Uh, Ms. Pryor. <clears throat> Sorry. Thank you. Good morning. Um, and. Uh, Thank you for the invitation to, to um, be here this morning. Um, I think the, the example, to be honest, was a little unfortunate um, in terms of, uh, of a youngster being uh, effectively entertained with a drawing while the teacher teaches. However, um, I think the point is well made that um, young people and children who have additional support needs um, need support by definition. Um, and many teachers do find themselves in the situation where, um, in fact, there is a, a lack of support for them and for the child in a classroom. Um, you know, and, and it, it is simply presenteeism. Um, that is not inclusion. Inclusion uh, means that a young person is included um, and is part of the class and engaged with the learning in that classroom. Um, so that has to be properly resourced. Okay, Mr. Muir, would you like to come in? Thank you, convener. Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Gibson. Uh, I think one of the issues that teachers face currently has been the significant increase in the number of children that are presenting with additional support needs. We've seen a sixfold increase in the last uh, decade, and I think that. Uh, Ten years ago, when uh, teachers were teaching their uh, classes, the number of children who were presenting with additional support needs was significantly less. Uh, I think, for me, the, the, the key to this is ensuring that the teacher education programmes uh, uh, allow uh, students coming through into the teaching profession to be more skilled in uh, the demands of uh, mainstreaming, uh, and, and secondly, 
that we provide uh, good quality additional uh, professional learning for teachers who, who are currently in the system. Uh, I think we have seen over the last few years significant improvements in uh, the, the, the number of courses that are available and in the initial teacher education programmes that are available uh, for teachers to come in more skilled. But for me, one of the issues is the, is, the, is the wide range of additional support needs that teachers have been expected to, to deal with within their classes. And I think you're right. I think as much support as uh, individual teachers can get makes a significant difference to the quality of the experience of those uh, children and young people. Okay, okay thanks um, very much. Okay, Mr. Gibson, I think Ms. Ms. Burnett and Ms. Bradley will both want to come in, and I'll come back to you. Okay, Ms. Cool. Ms. Burnett. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, in reply to your question, it is a concern when you expect a child who has been assessed for a need that has been identified, there should be a plan in place that enables that child or young person to be supported and the right mitigations and measures put in place to ensure that all that those child's needs are met throughout education. Now, I understand completely the pressures on teachers. But we have to be realistic. That young child has to go through education, and there is an expectation that when you put your child to school, that they are safe, secure, and they are being educated. Now, the example, yes, I give with Eileen, it's quite a poor example using a, a colouring sheet to, to, to divert the attention of that young person. But there's a duty and responsibility both on the school but also on the parent to ensure that child's needs been met. So I would expect that the, there's a robust sort of strategy in place from assessment and followed through by the teacher, because as we know, every teacher has an accurate record of what that child's needs are. Now, if it's a training and it's a lack of understanding what the additional support needs are, then yes, Ken's right, it has to be more robust than initial teacher education, all of which was picked up in Angela Morgan's review. We know going forward we've got a great sort of plan, action plan going forward that we're going to be implementing over the next year. It's a work in progress, but we all have a duty and responsibility. Presumption of mainstream has opened that door to ensure that every child gets an opportunity, a chance to learn. It is very challenging if you are a mainstream class of 30 and you have one teacher and maybe not enough adequate support. Resources are an issue, but it is not the legislation or the guidance. It is the fault. It is how it is implemented and how somebody understands it within a school environment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'll bring in Ms Bradley. Certainly, from the perspective of our members, there's no there's no question of the principle of presumption to mainstream. You know, the EIS is is wholly supportive of that, as are as are our members. And for the last ten years or so, you know, there have been um, uh, there have been a significant number of um, contributions made to our annual conference that that reassert. The, the commitment to the presumption to mainstream, but the real issue that our, our members experience in relation to its, um, the, the implementation of the associated legislation is, as others have said, in relation to resources. Um, it is very, very difficult for teachers to address the array of um, needs that they have in their class. There is an increasing complexity to those needs. Um, we have also seen this at a time of rising class sizes. Um, so, in addition to um, addressing an array of needs that all learners have, even if they don't have a certified additional support need, you also have significantly greater numbers of young people in large classes with additional support needs. So, we're almost we're almost kind of setting teachers up to fail um, by asking them to attend to all of these issues at once with um, lessening levels of special support. And this has been happening over a period of um, well, more than 10 years now, certainly since the onset of austerity. This is what our members have reported. Um, increasing need, um, increasing expectation in terms of what the curriculum should deliver for all of our young people, including those with additional support needs. And it's right that, that we have these bold ambitions for the curriculum, but this, th these expectations have arisen at a time when there has been diminishing resource, and that's really the crux of it. Hey, thanks very much, uh, panel. I mean, the reason I use that example is because it's actually a real life example. It's not one I just uh, invented, and it, it's an issue about whether the, the the people who are presumed to be able to go into mainstreaming are actually able to participate effectively in the work of the class uh, on all occasions. Now, it, it was mentioned about how uh, teachers are now becoming more skilled in dealing with um, ASN pupils, but if we're talking about 32% of the pupil body. Um, you know, could be five or even ten um, young people with a whole variety of different needs in a classroom. How is it possible for 
a teacher to be able to effectively teach a, a wide disparity of abilities within that class uh, and, and needs without the, um, support. And we know that the additional support uh, needs teachers have not kept up with the, the quintupling of numbers in the last decade. And how do teachers ensure that the 68% of pupils without additional support needs, including the most able, do not miss out on their education because the teacher understandably has to devote a disproportionate amount of time to ASN pupils. Now, clearly, this is a particular issue in schools where there's a where the attainment gap is the widest because they are more likely to have more ASN pupils. So the teachers have got a kind of, you know, got a real uphill struggle in, in some of these classrooms and schools. So how do we actually resolve these matters? We can't sweep them under the carpet. Obviously, uh, we need more support for our teachers and our schools. So what, what practical measures can be done to actually improve the situation, not just for the for the pupils, uh, whether the ASN or not, but also for the teachers themselves, and make that make it um, much easier for them to uh, to teach the class and all those within the class more effectively. <coughs> Thank you. Can I bring Mr. Muir in first? <coughs> Thank you, convener. Specifically in response to your uh, question, Mr. Gibson, I mean, I think whilst Angela Morgan's report shines a light on those issues around additional support needs and additional support for learning, I think <coughs> the answer uh, to your question lies in what she suggests within her report about the, the, the bigger asks of the education system. Is there a shared understanding of what the education system uh, going forward should be like. You know, what is it we value within education? I think one of the features in her report is that she talks about uh, the, the the system being designed for most, but that those children with additional support needs, although they're in, increasing in number, that they tend to be an add-on. They are additional, and I think the the answer lies in, in my mind to to looking at what we want from our education system and the extent to which we've got an education system that that genuinely uh, values difference and diversity. Uh, and I think for the longer term, that's the direction of travel where we will find a way of resolving this problem. And that would include, I think, as a result. A greater significance given to supporting the kind of children that you're talking about, who have got additional support needs, uh, and, and a system that, that recognises uh, what they can bring to the education system. Thank you. Thank you. Can I bring in Miss Bradley and then Miss Pryor? Thank you. Thanks. Um, in response to that question, I think that we need to look at the context in which we are in which we are operating currently. Um, at the end of 2018, as part of our Value Education Value Teachers campaign, we ran a survey of members, um, which received more than 12,000 responses at the time. Um, and one of the, the questions that we asked was um, for members to say whether they agreed or disagreed with the statement: "The provision for children and young people with additional support needs is adequate in my school." And 78% of the respondents to that survey disagreed or strongly disagreed with that statement. So that, that, that indicated to us that there's a real issue um, in the minds of teachers about the, the level of provision for young people. Um, actually, it featured um, among the top three areas of concern um, alongside pay and workload at that time. Um, and actually of the three, th those three sort of like top areas of um, concern for our members, Stress around additional support needs provision came up, came out the, the, the highest. So, in terms of like what, what we do about the scenario that we're in currently, I think that we have to look at this in the wider context of teacher workload and the, the demands upon teachers, um, not just in relation to additional support needs, but also that that survey also showed that um, people were 62 times more likely to report that they were stressed some or most of the time if they had also reported that they were struggling with um, additional support needs provision in the school or that they that they saw that additional support needs provision in the school was inadequate. So in terms of like how we respond to that, I think that there are a number of things that we need to that we need to think about. We need to think about the class sizes in the, the first answer that I gave. We have to do something about class sizes in the interest of um addressing teacher workload, but also improving the quality of the experience that all individual young people receive, and including those with additional support needs. Because if we reduce class sizes, then there is more time for teachers to devote to all young people in the class, um, and particularly those you know, who, have, who have additional needs. So there's, there's something to think about around that. Um, 
We also have to think about um, the fact that over the last 10 years or so, there has been a significant erosion in the number of people who have um, specialist additional support needs qualifications. So we're seeing, uh, as we move to this kind of uh, assumption and assertion that all teachers are teachers of um, additional support needs, which is true to an extent, we're also seeing an erosion of that specialism that we used to have in the system that would allow teachers to consult with colleagues who had that, qual that qualification, who had that specialist knowledge, in order that they could enhance their own practice or indeed have additional support with them in the classroom to work with young people, um, either individually or in small groups, in order that they were not just present at school, but fully included and participating in all of the activities that, you know, that are going on. On the point about inclusive pedagogy, um, there has been a bit of debate recently about whether it's whether we take an approach that is based on inclusive pedagogy, which is the assumption that all teachers are teachers of uh, additional support needs, or whether we do look at a more kind of specialist provision. We would argue that it's not either or. One should not preclude the other. It should be both. We have to have all teachers with sound knowledge of inclusive pedagogy, and they have to experience that as part of their initial teacher education um, experience, but it has to be part of an ongoing, continuing professional learning offer that is made to and that needs to be high quality, needs to be funded, needs to be um, made available to teachers on an equitable basis. Because one of the things that we've had reported to us um, by members over the period of austerity is that the opportunities for professional learning around professional, um, sorry, around additional support needs have also dwindled, and that's something that really has to be that really has to be addressed if we're going to move forward decisively um, in order to achieve what were the original ambitions of the additional support needs legislation, which, as I've said, the EIS wholly supports, but we, are, we have been concerned for, for some time now, certainly since the onset of austerity, about the lack of resources to ensure successful implementation of that legislation and all the surrounding values of that. Thank you, Ms. Bradley. Apologies for the fire alarm coming through there and some of the feedback. Can I bring in Ms. Pryor and then Ms. Burnett, and then I'll come back to Mr. Gibson. I think my um, perspective on this is that we're we're taking we're looking at the micro when we should be looking at the macro. Um, you know, we're looking at a question of what happens in a classroom, um, and actually, what Angela Morgan made clear in her report, and what we should, I think, we should be focusing on, is the fact that actually the, we need a systemic approach to change. Um, that young people and parents' voices need to be heard much more clearly. That we have to actually um, adopt. The, the, the practice that is set out in the legislation, that actually the principles of the legislation are absolutely sound. Um, what, what fails young people and, and, frankly, fails the system is the fact that we don't follow through on that. So, um, young people who have additional support needs, and can I say they don't always um, have poor educational attainment, um, but you know, young people who have additional support needs are seen as a problem. They are they are part of a, a, a deficit model around additional support needs, which um, has been exemplified really in the conversation so far this morning. That actually we are talking about children and young people, many of whom have great assets and great gifts, but we are not really focusing on those. We are focusing on how they are a, an issue, how they are a problem to teachers, how they are um, a cost, frankly, within local authorities. Um, they are seen as a drag on academic attainment. Um, and as long as those attitudes pertain, we are not going to make any progress. So, actually, I think we need to move away from the micro and start talking about the macro and how we actually change the system, because that is what Angela Morgan's report was really all about. Thank you. Ms Burnett, and then I will go back to Mr Gibson. Um, I totally agree with what Eileen had said there. So you have to look at the bigger picture. Angela Morgan's report was absolutely accurate. You need to ensure that it's consistent across the whole of Scotland because when we in PFS we did a full journey across Scotland, speaking directly to parents, finding out what their real real experiences were of the impact of having a child with additional support needs in education in Scotland. And to be honest, it was some quite it's quite a damning report in one sense. 
that we've actually got to this, this stage now we're now in 2021 at that point 2020 and now seeing the sort of the impact of what education is like for a, a parent trying to sort of move through that journey of ESN when you look at the sort of the whole packet the whole package for want of a better word we need to ensure there's consistency there has to be a robust strategy put in place parents have to be their voices have to be heard they are the foundation of children's learning so we have to un we understand what our children's needs are but it can be quite frustrating trying to get that across to a school if, if a teacher or a member of staff or an individual who has a responsibility of ensuring that your voice is heard and your child's needs are being met doesn't understand what those needs actually are and I think everything needs to change. We have to be able to work in partnership with your school and authority. Our voices, we understand our uh, children's needs. We have to make sure that, um, that those needs get recognised and implemented into the additional support plans or child plans. I feel that that's not even taken into consideration when a parent tries to even apply for a coordinated support plan. We have to ensure that teachers understand what those are, why they're needed, and it's not just words on paper or a highlighted little yellow dot in some child's folder that they may or may not have read at the start of term. Because it's quite frustrating for parents to be able to say, well, actually, my child has dyslexia, my child has autism, my child has um, ADHD. But then people don't understand the connotation of what additional support needs are. And if teachers don't understand just what ESN actually means, it could be a child that's bullied. It could be bereavement. It could be, as one member spoke earlier, about a gifted child. It could be a child who's beyond what's been taught in the class and needs to be pushed further. We need to be aware that right now, every child in Scotland effectively now has an additional support need. So, how do you support teachers to be able to make it consistent, that education fair and equitable? It's a challenge, but the, the review and the report highlights that, and I really. I can see a way forward, but we all have to work together, and parents are a huge part along with children and young people's voices. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. Question, because uh, we've had some excellent answers so far, which have been very helpful. Um, obviously, we've seen the number of children with ASN rocket from 37,000 to 208,000 over the last decade, and the review says. It's an open question as to the extent that this trend reflects changes in identification and recording practices in schools or increases in need. And I would think most people would would assume both. But in, in practical terms, to go back to the, the macro question, how can the huge increase uh, in ASN teachers and other support staff needed to deal with this be funded and recruited to keep pace? Because I think it's it's um, not just about culture in the classroom, but we do need additional resources in that. And we have to look at this from a, a practical and pragmatic point of view if we're to try and relieve some of the pressure on teachers and some of the stress that was talked about earlier and ensure that pupils, whether or not they have a additional support needs, are effectively uh, catered for and have all the uh, learning uh, opportunities that they, they could uh, make the most of, um, you know, so, so they can uh, get the most benefit from, from that. Thank you. I'll bring in Mr Muir and then I'll go to Ms Bradley. Thanks, Convener. I, I think it's important that uh, we understand that although teachers have a, a critical role to play because they are face to face with these children and young people in their classes, that uh, dealing with additional support needs uh, goes beyond just education. Uh, one of the things that will support children and young people, and importantly the, their parents, the carers, uh, and, and the, their families, is better integration uh, between the services that have an impact on that child's ability to learn in the classroom. So whilst it's, it's true that teachers have a critically important role, and as I said before, uh, you know, I think the, the ongoing career-long professional learning of teachers who have had to deal with this significant increase in the proportion of young people uh, presenting with additional support needs, that certainly needs to be met. Uh, likewise, as I said earlier, how we prepare teachers to come into the teaching profession. But I think we need to bear in mind that this is not an education-only problem, uh, or the solution to it, rather, is not just in education. I think the integration of services, uh, social work services, care services, health services, and so on, working alongside practitioners, has to be part of the recipe for going forward. Hey, Ms. Bradley and then Ms. Pryor. 
Um, I think Ken's right to say that um, you know that the solutions here don't rest um, solely in terms of in terms of education, because in term in relation to the rising numbers and, and the you know the significantly increased numbers of young people with additional support needs over the last decade or so, I think that we have to look at the impact of austerity. So you have significantly larger numbers of children and young people living in poverty. And when you have children uh, begin even early years education, having begun the first few years of their lives living in poverty, they are already at a, an educational disadvantage. So in terms of language acquisition, in terms of even physical development, etc. So I think there's a there's a really strong correlation between incidence of additional support needs and incidence and experience of poverty. So, so the point about this not all the solution to this not all resting within the education system is absolutely right. Because in order to address poverty, we have to look at you know all, all sorts of aspects of our economy and public services um, and, and so on, you know, employment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But in terms of in terms of the solution to it, as far as um, education can deliver that, we have to be looking at additional investment. And there has been for for some time debate across. Um, or between national and local government about whose responsibility it is to divert additional resource to um, additional support needs provision. From our point of view, we do not mind who, who provides the additional funding, but somebody has to do it, um, and there has to be collaboration. Well, we, would, we would say that there should be collaboration between national and local government to solve this this conundrum, because while while the debate continues about who's going to fund additional support needs provision or generally provide more funding for education, um, the young people who are who are most disadvantaged by the current set of circumstances continue to be disadvantaged, and that is that is that is unjust. There has to be you know there has to be a solution found to this. Um, quickly, we cannot have another decade of um, rising levels of child poverty, rising levels of um, incidence of additional support needs, and resources either remaining static or dwindling even further. Thank you. I am going to go to Ms Pryor and then to Mr Johnson. Thank you. I think again, um, you know, my, my, my sense from the, the, the tenor of the conversation this morning is very much a deficit model. Um, both both Ken and Andrea make valid points that this is absolutely um, the incidence of ASN is absolutely linked to poverty um, and and wider social ills. There's there's no doubt about it. However, um, if we constantly look at this as a deficit, as as a problem. Then our mindset is that we have to deal with these children, that we have this hurdle to overcome. And yet Angela Morgan makes it absolutely clear that actually, um, if we if we reset our approach um, so that we are we are welcoming and identifying um, the, 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 the the gifts and the skills and the attributes of both the young people and their families, um, and welcoming that into our schools, then that mind shift alone helps to move things forward. You know, we we work with parents. You know that that is that's our our sphere. Um, and Angela's report made crystal clear that parents feel their knowledge, their contribution. Is constantly rebuffed, um, more than rebuffed. In fact, um, it is is actually unwelcome. So, parents who have brought a child into the world, who have uh, who know that child better than anyone, and who have a lifelong investment in that child, um, their contribution and their knowledge is um, ignored or not welcome within a school. My point, I think, is that. You know, we have to actually pool resources here. Um, you can go to some of the poorest parts of the world, um, and they have inclusive schools. And that is because the attitude is everyone is welcome here, and everyone who contributes has a role. And that means families, and that means community. So I'm I'm not saying that resource is not an issue. Yes, but that's always an issue. But actually, the attitude and our mindset around young people with additional support needs, to me, there is a question as to whether ASN is a helpful 
thing because, as, as you say, we've seen additional support needs mushroom over over the last years. Um, and so, if more children are, are in that deficit place, where does that put us as an education system? I think we really have to think carefully about that. Um, but you know, it is an attitude. It's an attitude within the system, um, within schools, uh, within local authorities, which has to change. Okay, just before we go to Mr. Johnson, I think Ms. Burnett wants to come in on that point too. Yeah, when you look at the 2019 census, I mean, it was quite clear that 93% of children in mainstream classes had an additional support need. It's quite. It's quite frustrating as a parent. I am a parent with a child with additional support needs. I totally understand what what it's like to actually go to a school and approach and say, actually, your, your child may have a concern with my child. How do you move forward? And that's replicated by what we see nationally. The, the, the voice of parents, as Eileen said, it's very difficult when you go to a school and you try to say, I'm raising a concern, and you don't feel that your voice is heard. You don't know where to go because you don't understand the legislation and guidance. You're, nobody, no, there's no booklet or signpost, a one-stop shop that says, "Here you go, as a parent, this is the journey that you take. This is what your expectations are." Okay, just like what Andrea said earlier, it's a wide journey. It's not just education. Parents appreciate that because you may have to go through your health board or your GP or CAMS or a health professional or a professional to actually move forward and be able to then create that joined-up approach. Not always in the case parents don't even understand what a CSP is, a coordinated support plan. They don't understand that other professionals can come in and support your child. When you go to a school, it can, occasion can be a barrier. But for all that negativity, there's a lot of positivity because there's a lot of good examples in Scotland of things that work well. We have all these sort of areas that we're supposed to have shared best practice, things that have worked well. There's a lot of good examples in Edinburgh. There's a lot of good example in Glasgow. There's some in South Lanarkshire. We have to be able to work together, and it needs to be that joined-up approach, because we, be, we do, as parents, become experts. Unfortunately, we have to research the guidance, the legislation, to see where do we stand. So it's using that. When you look back to Angela Morgan's Review in her report, the recommendation about working together, working in partnership. That key word is partnership. The, the most, the absolute first word should be communication, because by communication, then we can start building that conversation. A starter for ten, opening that door, making it welcome for a parent. It should never be challenging. You should never be made to feel that your voice isn't heard and it doesn't mean anything, because. It's demeaning, and you f you feel so destroyed when you leave a school and you think actually they don't get it, they don't see what I see in the house, and that that can be a challenge. But as I said, for all the negativity, we are moving forward. We have the Angela Morgan's review, we have this re these recommendations, and we now have an action plan that should hopefully build the foundations and move forward so these things start turning into a more positive journey for parents and children and young people. Thank you for that, Ms. Burnett. Um, I'm going to bring in Mr. Johnson. I just want to make a comment. Maybe you could um, weave in with um, your answers um, coming forward. And you mentioned a lot of places, and, and there have been a no one-stop shop for parents to go to. But um, I just wondered where Inquire sits in that that landscape, and, and whether um, um, you've got experience of Inquire, and is that working well as an advocacy service funded by the government? But I'll bring in Mr. Johnson to ask his question too. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, convener. And, and, and I actually, I'd like to reinforce what Eileen is saying. So, and in so doing, I'll, I'll remind the committee of my interest. So, I, I have a diagnosis of ADHD, and I'm a trustee of the ADHD Foundation. But you know, in 1982, when I first started school, I wouldn't have appeared in the ASN statistics. And that certainly did not mean that I didn't have an additional support need back then, because I very much did. As my reports uh, from school would have told you, that I couldn't concentrate in class. I fidgeted. Um, I, I didn't keep up. I remember on one of my very first days of school, uh, when we, we were getting the, everyone was asked to uh, you know, put ten accounting bricks together. I was the very, very last child to finish that by some margin. So my additional support need, not that it, 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 it suddenly appeared when that definition appeared. It, it, you know, it was something that always existed, and that's true of the vast bulk of children that we're talking about. These are not new needs that have occurred; they, they are needs that we have become much better at identifying. Now, there is also 
the addition of children who might have been in specialist education. But, but I think that the vast bulk is a, a, a result as a better understanding. So my, my key question is, is, is this. Is, I mean, I, I completely accept that we need more resource, but I think we also need to ensure that teachers are skilled properly. So, in terms of initial teacher education, you know, how are we going to progress that agenda? You know, and I think in particular for neurodevelopmental disorders, you know, we are talking about a, 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 at least you know, one in five children uh, will be diagnosable, and there'll be people, uh, children beyond that diagnosable bracket. Who uh, will at least have traits? Uh, 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 so I'd just be interested from the panel's perspective of how do we take uh, initial teacher education forward to improve the school skills and, and enable them to, to better address these needs or, you know, for, for, for children who uh, have issues, whether that, that you know they were identified under the ASN bracket or not. Um, I'm going to bring Ms. Pryor and then Mr. Muir. Thank you very much. Um, can I go back to your question about inquire? Um, because, like Cheryl, I also have um, a young person in my family now, an adult who has a learning disability. So I did um, avail myself quite regularly of inquire services. Um, I would say that the um, inquire is not an advocacy service. Inquire will provide advice and information around the legislation. So they will point you, or the policy. So they will point you to uh, what the policy or legislation says. They don't provide advocacy, um, and they will not. I, I think probably it's fair to say they will not go into um, the fine detail of your particular child's issues. I don't think that's what they're there for, and I don't think that's a possibility. Um, so it's very much um, clarifying for you what the legislation says. And as we all know, um, actually, legislation and policy sometimes has some yawning gaps in terms of what does that actually mean and what does reasonable mean? You know, there's a great word. Uh, reasonable is, uh, is, is an issue. So can I also just pick up on the um, Daniel's point about initial teacher education? Um, so I think he's absolutely right. You know, uh, certainly when I was at school many, many, many years ago, um, I would say there were at least three people in my class at secondary school um, who I would now look back at and say, "Gosh, yeah, you had autism or you had whatever." Um, so yes, it's it's about identification very often. Um, in terms of teacher education. Um, one of the, the issues that I have, uh, that we as an organisation and I have raised very many times, is that um, teacher education, uh, currently initial teacher education, provides very little insight for uh, beginning teachers into the partnership um, that they are entering into, the partnership with others in their school. Um, classroom assistants, whatever, um, others who will provide support, whether that's social work or youth work or health, physiotherapists, speech and language therapists, um, and parents. So um, at the moment, I would say that initial teacher education is extremely light. Um, and by, by taking that approach, what they do is they place all of the responsibility on the shoulders of that teacher. And they, they effectively say, you're the saviour in here. Um, whereas actually, as a teacher, as a classroom teacher, you're part of a team. You know, we talk all the time about the team around the child. Well, I'm not all that fond of that phrase, but that is effectively uh, the role of the teacher is part of a team to support a child. Um, and that team includes parents, family, and it may include other professionals, and it may include other staff within the school. Um, so having an understanding when you come out of initial teacher education of that bigger picture, the, the wider group of people who will support your class, you know, the young people within your class, I think is really, really important. Um, and you know, and I would say, of course, um, that actually the role of parents and their uh, function as the primary educators and the person who has the, the, the lifelong commitment and engagement with that child um, 
you know, that, that is what sets parents apart. Um, and very often you will find that parents know much more about the condition their child has if there is a disability, because they've taken a lot of time to research it. Um, and and you know, they are a resource that schools currently very rarely use effectively. Okay, I'm going to bring in Mr Muir and then Ms Bradley. Thank you, Convener. In response to Mr Johnson's uh, question and also to what Eileen said, I, I think, uh, as many of you will know, one of the roles of the General Teaching Council for Scotland is to accredit the initial teacher education programmes. Uh, I think I can give some reassurance that the picture has changed quite significantly in recent years. I think the catalyst for that, to some extent, was the Committee's 2017 report on uh, how is additional support for learning working in practice. Uh, as a result of that, uh, I know that the, the university uh, or the institutions that offer teacher education have looked very closely at their programmes uh, and have ensured that they, they embed the principles of equality, diversity and inclusion. Uh, what that means in practice is that when we accredit these programmes, uh, these institutions are asked to provide evidence of how they will do a number of things. So, for example, uh, supporting the, uh, the, the the students' understanding of the GERFEC agenda, uh, what is meant by inclusion. Uh, it's difficult because of the range of additional support needs that we've heard about this morning that uh, a teacher education, particularly a one-year teacher education programme, can cover the range of additional support needs that are required. But there is very much, and I can reassure Eileen, that one of the changes that GTC Scotland has made to its accreditation criteria is that the institutions presenting their programmes to us uh, are asked to provide evidence of areas around the, the, the student's parental uh, understanding of parental involvement and how other services and providers link with the education system. So, I think yes, as I said at the beginning in response to Mr. Gibson's question, I think teacher education has got an important role to play. But as Andrea said herself, it's not just about teacher education programmes. They've got they've got a critical role to play, but we we also need to look at how we support early career teachers going through their probation and, and their career long professional learning as as the as the different types of additional support needs change and, and as we see continue to grow. Thank you. Um I'll bring in Miss Bradley and then Miss Burnett. Yeah just to I would just echo what Ken has said there about um the, the, the recent um maybe like sharpened focus on additional support needs within initial teacher education. That's something that the EIS has been interested in, alongside you know what the what the emphasis has been on um, equality matters within initial teacher education programmes too. You know we've had we've had uh, quite quite a number of conversations in recent recent years with university um, heads of school of education about those very areas because we were concerned for a time that maybe some of the inputs around around these areas was was too light. Um, so um, good, you know, good that Ken's able to report that there has been a, an improved picture there in recent years. But the point about the, um, you know, what can be achieved for um, a student teachers within a say a year long course is 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 well made. You know, that's already a very very packed course where teachers have to have a, a, a um, teachers in training have to have a balance of you know theory and um, in school practice, and there are a number of demands. Um, you know, an array of demands actually made of, of that 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 time. It's a very it's a very fast year. Um, so so the point about um, career long professional learning at all stages of a teacher's career beyond their initial teacher education is absolutely critical. And to go back to what I said earlier, that is that is an area that teachers have been reporting for some time significant um, deficits within. You know there has been there has been a a, a shrinkage in the number of um, Courses available, not that all professional learning, of course, is, um, is is courses. You know that's not how teachers should experience professional learning. But that is, you know, that that is one one type of learning that that because um, it requires funding, 
has, um, you know, has we, we've seen significant uh, cuts in. And actually, in response to that, the EIS over the last couple of years has been providing professional learning to members, um, specifically around additional support needs, trying to look at it both generally, but also in terms of specificity. And um, you know, looking at that array of needs that can be quite difficult to cover within a very short space of time, particularly within uh, one year initial teacher education courses. But I also wanted to pick up on something that. You know, the Eileen was saying, uh, um, certainly from our point of view, I haven't meant to give the impression at all that, that, that young people are perceived to be the problem by, by our members. Not at all. Um, our, our members, in engaging with us around additional support needs, um, are absolutely um, committed, earnest in their commitment to young people with additional support needs, and they see it as wholly unjust. That they are not being provided the support that they that they require. Many of them very much see themselves as partners with parents in trying to advocate for young people to get the absolute best provision that they can. But they frequently find themselves having to jump through bureaucratic hoops time after time after time. And um, you know that take that, that are put in place and that take a long time for them to go through. And there seems to be a lot of gatekeeping around what we understand to be quite scarce resources. So I think that some of that maybe lack of engagement with parents is about some of that kind of gatekeeping kind of behaviour that has um, that has um, emerged because everybody knows everybody knows there aren't enough resources currently within the the education sector to go around and there aren't enough resources to go around specifically when it comes to additional support needs. Thank you, uh, Ms. Burnett. I call on your point earlier, convenient regarding um, Inquire. Inquire is one piece of a huge jigsaw puzzle for parents. So Inquire, as I said, we talked about that one stop shop would be phenomenal for parents to probably access. But the realistic picture is Inquire have specific they've got a specific journey, a specific point, specific information. They support transition, support placement, they've got a great booklet which explains to parents, okay, as Eileen said. What happens in legislation, guidance, your kind of rights, what to expect. But then you haven't, as Eileen's quite rightly said, they're not mediation service, they're not advocacy service. But there's other really good um, places out there, charities, organisations that, that, that do support parents. But the problem is there's nowhere to go to get that to find that. It's like it's like Chinese whispers. You find one, oh, you spoke to somebody, all right, okay, then you move on and then you move on again. It's making sure that information is readily available to parents. Um, in regards to even like my own journey, did I know about Inquire at the very start of my child's ASN journey? No, it's it's how you find things out as you move on. And I, I keep using that word journey because that's what it is. It doesn't stagnate, it evolves, it moves, it's not a straight path. And I totally understand when we talk about initial teacher education, but we also got to remember teachers get supported by pupil support assessment assistance. So there's another connotation in the classroom support. We have to ensure that those pupil support or support for learning assistance also get the correct training and interventions and mitigations put in place to ensure that they can follow through in their job. Because yes, a teacher is there to create class plans and work out what the lesson is going to be, move forward, how they're going to initiate that child's education and meet the needs of that child. But again, it's back down to resource. It has to be resourced. The skills have to be met. They have to be built on. So you can't expect somebody to be employed as a support assistant to come in and understand what that child's needs are. And I'm very much aware that it is a partnership, but it's communication. We all have to talk to each other. Because if we don't talk to each other, the walls come back up, the barriers are there, and it becomes an even more sort of arduous journey to try and navigate through. And it's it's really clear to me that yes, I completely understand that yeah, foundations are now starting to be met through initial teacher education. I agree with Andrea said, it's also about career along professional learning. But it's how that's managed. If it's not compulsory, then will it get done? You've got an expectation of presumption of mainstream. So you've got a lot of children, young people currently early, early years, childcare go right through to primary, transitioning to secondary, and then the support beyond. You've got charities in, around there that do all that work behind the scenes, but it's never put to the forefront to support schools because it comes back down to funding. It could be down to PEF. We talk about empowering schools, empowering parents, national improvement framework, parents and carers, children at the heart. But it needs to be that consistent journey. We need to support each other. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Mr. Johnson, and then I'll bring in Ms. Pryor um, first. After Mr. Johnson. 
I, I'd just like to put a, a question uh, to uh, uh, both Cheryl Burnett and Ken Muir. And it's just really unpacking this point about the, the, the one year of, of ITE. So, I, I mean, I guess I would just challenge you both in terms of, is this really an either or situation? If you look in, in particular at neurodevelopmental disorders, what we're talking about, I think, is improved understandings of uh, executive function, uh, focus, emotional regulation. So, uh, uh, and you're also talking about conditions which uh, probably uh, uh, impact a, a very significant proportion of the classroom. So, I, I guess my question is, is this actually a, a question of an additional element to ITE and indeed to uh, continuous professional development, or is this about embedding something that cuts across the whole of teaching practice? And surely, many of these approaches that would improve focus emotional regulation, understanding how children actually learn and, and how different brains learn actually benefit not just the, the children who are diagnosable, but actually all children. So is this actually something that layers across uh, teacher education rather than being a, a, an additional element to it, or at least in part, is that the solution? Yeah, that was directed at Mr. Muir, but I'm going to bring Eileen back in First, and then I'll come to Mr. Muir. Um, so, to just to address that point, um, Daniel, I would absolutely agree with you, because if it's good for one child, it's very likely to be good for many children. Um, and so, learn, you know, for teachers to adopt um, approaches which address, um, for instance, visual learners. There will be visual learners in the class who don't have a diagnosis. Um, you know, that's an example. And, and you're absolutely right that actually it's about um, a wider understanding rather than trying to understand every single diagnosis that might be um, there in your class, as it were. So the diagnoses of, of all of these children and young people. Um, you know, I think we have the, the, the building blocks in place, but you know, if we use, for example, the CSP, which Cheryl mentioned, well, there's something where you know they're like hen's teeth now. We local authorities um, do not want to use CSPs; they want to use children's plans. We've come across many parents who have been told by local authorities, "We don't do CSPs now. We don't do them." Well, you know, you can't just not do a CSP. Um, that is a, a it, that is a requirement, and it's a legal right. And of course, um, that's why local authorities don't want them because it places um, a burden, as they see it, on them to provide support for children. So, as long as we have those um, attitudes and approaches within local authorities, that basically um, it's the line of least resistance. We will do the bare minimum um, that we can in terms of resources. Um, then, you know, we have we have a challenge, and that's the kind of challenge that Angela Morgan's report highlighted. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring in um, Ken and then Cheryl's and uh, Ken and then Miss Bradley and then uh, um, Miss Burnett. Um, but I know Mr. Greer also has a question on CSPs. Ross, do you want to ask that very quickly, then, before we go back to witnesses? Thanks, convener. Um, it was essentially what Aileen Pryor has just said. Um, it was the, the difference between a, a CSP and the other plans that are now offered by local authorities, and um, how, how effective the dwindling number of CSPs are. Have, have the number of CSPs uh, declined because those that are left are still resulting in adequate support being delivered, or has there been a corresponding erosion in the quality of CSPs at the same time as there's been uh, an erosion in the number of CSPs that are actually issued? Okay, um, I'm going, going to go back to uh, Mr. Muir and Ms. Bradley, um, noting Daniel's direct question to them, and then I'll come to Ms. Burnett. So, if we go to Ken Muir first, please. Thank you, convener. I, mean, I think I can give Mr. Johnson some reassurance based on what I said earlier on there about how the initial teacher education program 
think I can give a guarantee that every initial teacher education programme that GTC, the GTC Scotland accredits, is is very much uh, underpinned by a requirement that teachers understand what is meant by inclusive practice and the methodologies that they can adopt to ensure that 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 that, that, that their practice is inclusive and. Also, the, the initial teacher education programmes are very much predicated on GTC Scotland's professional standards, which are very values-based, and social justice is an important part of that. So, I think the kind of ITE programmes that we're seeing now are very different to the kind of programmes that we saw, dare I say, even five years ago. And I think it's also important to stress that initial teacher education programmes are not year-long programmes. Uh, a postgraduate program is 36 weeks, 18 weeks of which are on placement. So the initial teacher education institutions have 18 weeks in which to cover a very wide range of things to ensure that teachers are in a position, or student teachers, in a position to go into the probationary year. So again, we've talked a lot about the importance of career-long professional learning for teachers who are newly qualified and in service. And as I said earlier to Mr. Gibson's uh, question, I think that's a critical part of how we address some of the issues that we're facing just now in respect of uh, ESL. Uh, Ms. Bradley, just very simply, say in response to um, Daniel's question that, it's, that the, the approach should be. Both. It should be a, you know, a, a, an embedding of um, a lot of the principles of inclusion and inclusive pedagogy across the, the range of um, ITE experience and CLPL experience. But also, there has to be some specificity in terms of teachers understanding maybe some of the. Okay, maybe not every single, um, you know, condition that there might be because there are so many of them and and so many complexities to them. Given the, you know, the the, the fact that we're dealing with so many thousands of individual young people, so. You you can't possibly cover every single every single one, but maybe those which present most commonly. So, for example, ADHD is one which which um, presents quite commonly, and I think it's really important for teachers to understand, um, you know, the, the nature of that condition and what the particular challenges are for young people who who experience who experience that. So, I think it's a combination a combination of um, of both. In relation to the question about um, CSPs, I think that's, that that kind of speaks a little bit to what I was beginning to say about maybe some gatekeeping around resources. Um, I think that um, there's obviously there's obviously much closer monitoring of um, CSPs, the number of them, the outcomes from them, because of the statutory nature of them, and so perhaps because of that in, enhanced scrutiny around. CSPs, there's maybe more of a reluctance to to, to open them for young people than um, would be the case for child plans, which are which are not statutory. Um, and, and and I think that, that that's one of the the things that members have reported to us as an element of you know this kind of um, you know kind of manoeuvring and um, massaging maybe of the bureaucracy to to manage what are scarce resources and to, to slow down. Or inhibit access to you know to the limited resources that are available. It can I bring in Miss Burnett. I think Mr. Muir wants to come back in as well. Mr. Uh, Miss Burnett. Thank you. Um, in reply to Daniel's comment regarding on you know typical child with maybe potentially autism spectrum disorder or ADHD and using the visual cues of visual learner. Yes, I agree. Absolutely agree. There's all these strategies are great. How do we resource it? Because at the end of the day, it does need to be resourced. It's additional time on teachers, and the expect expectation on initial teacher education, like Ken said, like thirteen weeks, eighteen weeks, thirty, 30 thirty six weeks, or whatever it was, and eighteen weeks on a placement. It's a lot for a person to take on board. But you look at the curriculum for excellence. You look at the fact that health and well-being is, is factored into that. So again, back in your national improvement framework, we've all got a duty and responsibility. We all should have an awareness, regardless of whether you're a teacher or a, any support staff or any member of staff, that all these children will present differently. We're not all born the same way. We all think differently. We're independent. And a child with additional support needs, potentially autism spectrum disorder, their brains are just wired differently. It's not that they can't do the work. We just need to find an alternative way that switches that little light bulb on that we can then support those children going forward. And actually, it's not it's not fair to just dismiss 
the work that teachers do and think not all teachers do these. There is a phenomenal amount of teachers in Scotland that think outside the box and support children's learning and, put, and go be, uh, above and beyond um, what, what's expected of them in a, in a, daily, a daily plan or a daily a, a school day to support these children and young people. I think that also has to be recognised. But it's about how we build that collective shared practice, for want of a better word, so it can be widely recognised that this could be a potential strategy for support. You do have the National Improvement Hub, where Education Scotland store an awful lot of information and strategies and information for teachers to access that is open to all. It is about making sure that it is consistent and that people are aware that these, there are places to go to for information. Um, I would like to also speak to, about uh, Ross Greer's about the Coordinated Support Plan. It is about a lack of understanding. Um, to be really honest, not many parents know a coordinated support plan even exists. They assume um, that the child's plan now, across, as I said earlier, I travelled across Scotland just prior to the report being published to gather views and parents. If I was to ask, do you know what, what plan your child has? The majority of parents will say, no, what is that? Because they're all named differently. It could be child plan, it could be individual individual education plan, it, it could be additional support for learning plan, it could be a form four. If you go to Falkirk, it's all got different names. And on a rare occasion you do hear a parent say, Oh, I, I applied for a coordinated support plan, but the experience was challenging, it was horrific, it's there's no joined up approach. And as a parent, when you look at a, a child with regardless of their additional support needs, there is a lot of issues around the CSP, and whilst I'm very much aware there's a review about to be undertaken into the coordinated, the coordinated support plan, many parents with their child will meet the first four criteria of what is a coordinated support plan. But what will always trip them up, and what they'll not be able to get, is, is what it classifies as significant. What does that mean for a parent? What does that mean for a child? What does that mean for an education authority or the wider partners that that multi-agency approach to move forward? So for me, it needs to be clearer. I think again, I agree what was mentioned earlier. Funding is an issue. What Andrea said about could it be that could be a holding pattern? Because actually, if they commit to a coordinated support plan, the funding essentially follows the child. Whereas all these other plans, although they tick the box and although they have support strategies in place and recommendations, they're not legally binding. So, therefore, it can be removed at any point, and that is what you are finding with parents, and this becomes a challenge or a battle or a fight. or a, You feel like a washing machine, quite honestly. It is like rinse and repeat. Every year you go through the same situation. You tell them what the issues are. You get, that is great. We will put this in place, and then it comes back down to it is not ring-fenced. So it goes, or you lose that member of staff who understands your child. So There are multiple factors at play on both Daniel's question and on Rossi's question. Um, I'm going to bring in Mr Muir again. Convener, just briefly, again, uh, in response to Mr Johnson's query uh, about the ITE programmes and what Angela said about the, the specific uh, uh, learning difficulties that some youngsters have, uh, there is a requirement on the uh, initial teacher education institutions to consider the main areas of uh, uh, learning difficulty, uh, autism, dyslexia, ADHD, uh, Tourette's syndrome, and so on. And there is a lot out there, as uh, as uh, Cheryl was suggesting. I think the issue is the teachers having the time to be able to look at those. So, for example, the General Teaching Council has recently published a number of professional guides to complement the professional standards. And the four that we've we've looked at. Have been in the areas of additional support needs. There's one in equality and diversity. There's one in autism. There's one in dyslexia, and there's one in uh, neurological uh, disorders. And teachers find those useful, but equally, teachers come back and say, "They're there. We know they're there. We know that Education Scotland's improvement hub's got a lot of resources in it. How do we create the space and time to allow them to take advantage of what are very good resources and very good uh, opportunities for professional learning that are out there?" Thank you. Um, I've got three members, uh, Ms Mackay, Ms Bishop and Mr Green, all wanting to come in. If any other members have um, questions, it would be helpful if they could put an R in the chat. But I'll go to Ms Mackay first. Thanks. Oh, um, could we go to Ms Bishop first, please? Thank you, Convener. Um, I had was just uh, actually following on from the discussion about um, funds being ring fenced. 
um, or not, as the case may be. Um, how consistent do you, are you aware of local authority finance um, returns in in uh, their identification of spending on um, additional support learning? Uh, I'm looking to see if the panel want to come in on that at all. I think you've got an R in the chat. Yes, Miss Bradley first. Thanks. Just, just very quickly on this, um, what what we what we know and understand, and, and I'm sure the panel, uh, sorry, I'm sure the committee is aware of this too. Local authorities, because they have different means of I different means of categorising additional support needs, it's very difficult to keep track of how local authorities are um how local authorities are addressing the range of additional support needs, you know, what mechanisms they have in place to do that, what funding has been attributed, um, and it's very difficult to make comparisons across local authorities because of that because of that um disparity in the way that they classify and record record need. So we, we find that a bit like trying to, you know, when we're trying to, to, to get a national picture on that and a, and a local authority picture on that, it's it's kind of like um, trying to nail jelly to the wall because you're not always comparing like with like. It's very very slippery. That's been our that's been our experience of that in recent years. Just before I go to Mr. Muir, uh, I know um, Mr. Mandel has a question, particularly in rural about rurality um, and, and rural, so not rurality, but rural issues. Um, Mr. Mandel, do you want to come in briefly and ask your supplementary there? Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, convener. I heard the panelists mention earlier the, the impact of uh, PEF on uh, your support for for ESN. Um, and I just wondered if they had views on on those smaller schools. Um, I have a number of them in my constituency, but there are, there are a, you know there are similar schools spread right across Scotland who don't who still don't receive any pupil equity funding, um, and often uh, you know, can can have a, you know a single teacher um, and and limited uh, you know time uh, with, with classroom assistance and other things. Do you see a difference uh, in those schools, and, and do you think it's something that needs to be addressed? Thank you. Um, Ms. Padley, did you want to come back in before we go to Mr. Muir on that point? Yeah, I could say something quickly on that. Um, so we would see, I mean, of course, all, all money that's going into schools has to be welcomed, but we see PEF in terms of a funding mechanism to be quite an imperfect one. Um, and for the reasons that um, Mr. Mundell has just outlined, not all schools receive PEF funding, although in the last um, 12 to 18 months, there has been an increase in the number of schools that have been in receipt of, of, of those additional funds, which of course has to be a good thing in the absence of, you know, in the absence of other, you know, sort of differently, um, you know, differently um, shaped funding streams. Um, but, but, but you, you do have, you do have, as I said earlier, that high correlation between incidence of poverty and incidence of additional support needs. So. You know, we, we, I know from I know from what many schools are doing with their PEF money that lots of it is being channeled towards additional support needs, but it would be for the for the young people obviously who are who are living in poverty. Not all young people with additional support needs are living in poverty, and um, not all young people um, with additional support needs are attending schools that are in receipt of PEF funding. So PEF funding is a means of addressing the, the additional support needs question in its entirety. Is, isn't isn't adequate. It's not. It, it can't be the answer to this. It's maybe part of the answer for the time being, but we would see it as being not the long term um, solution to this. Not the long term means by which um, educate. Sorry, additional support needs provision should be funded. Um, Mr. Muir, I was just going to suggest that Ms. Wishart's question might be better uh, answered by uh, Jennifer King in the second session. Uh, specifically from the IDES perspective, but just in response to Mr. Uh, Mundell's question, uh, I think uh, there, 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 there is a way ahead in, in the smaller schools and, and those that do not necessarily have access to resources on site. Uh, there, is, there is potential through the, the work of the regional improvement collaboratives, which have been brought in to try and provide more localised support. And I think the other thing I would say is that uh, the whole empowerment agenda, although it's perhaps uh, sat a bit in the back burner over the last nine or ten months, I think schools having that and head teachers having that greater degree of empowerment 
over how they use any funding that comes to them. Again, perhaps as a way in which some of these uh, uh, issues that uh, Mr. Mundell raises might be better addressed in future. Yeah, I'm going to go to Ms. Burnett, and then I'll come back to Beatrice. Thanks. I just wanted to reiterate that we are fully aware of the sort of pressures that are on. It's not just about the rural schools; it's also about remote, because quite honestly, they can be actually two different things. So when you think about a rural school, so you've got your urban and your rural, they're in the outer fringes of um, societies. They don't actually get access to a lot of the resources. And sort of, as I spoke earlier about all these organisations that are able to interlink and support uh, parents uh, going forward. Um, South Lanarkshire is where I represent parents for my own as part of MPFS out with being the vice chair. And we are very much made up of urban, rural and remote. There are significant challenges faced by schools, not just on the pressures of teaching, because if you're in a, a really remote school, you could have one school with maybe six pupils, but actually how do you then but are not going to be entitled to a pupil equity fund? It's also there's a lot of community driven support or initiatives that have to be put in place because quite honestly trying to get access externally and brought back internally to these schools is quite a challenge. So it's how do we move forward that with that? Again, I agree with what Ken has said regarding there is a role to be played with the regional improvement collaboratives. It is about sharing practice, but it's also finding new ways and adapting all the recommendations in that review that Angela Morgan has uh, envisioned and taken forward and how that is then the key word is implemented going forward because it's about being equitable. We talk about inclusion, and it shouldn't matter if you're in an inner city school to a remote or rural school with five or six uh, pupils. It's about equity, and we need to find that balance going forward. Ms. Wishart? Um, the next panel, the same question. Um, I just, I have another, a, a brief question for um, Andrea, please. Uh, it, it refer in referring to the EIS 2019 report, um, there were concerns about a creeping undervaluing of specialism um, in terms of a, the sort of undervaluing, actually by society, of what was predominantly carried out by by women, um, and often perceived as something that anyone can do. So I just wondered if you had any uh, comment or any update um, from that report. Hey, Ms. Badley. Yeah, not 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 so much an update, but just to, uh, I suppose we were trying to reflect what um, you know what members had been telling us about their experience as additional support needs teachers. So increasingly in recent years, um, what's happened is that when there has been um, cover required elsewhere in the school, you know the cover would be stopped from the additional support needs team. So um, teachers who would ordinarily work with individuals or small groups within um, within whole class settings um, on a on a regular basis, then being pulled from that you know from that provision in order to be able to cover classes for for absent teachers, not necessarily in areas of their subject specialism, say in the secondary sector, and a similar thing happening in primary, where where you know schools actually a lot of this is actually funded by PEF money would employ someone. To work with um, groups of young people who had additional support needs linked to their socio-economic backgrounds, um, and then finding that with them, um, with the you know with the, the demands of cover and the the lack of availability of of supply or or lack of funding to to pay for supply teaching, being pulled from that extra provision that they were giving to those really quite vulnerable young people, um, and having to having to cover classes, and they're being really kind of. I suppose sporadic experience for the young people, but also a sense for the person who is a an additional support needs teacher that um, actually the, the, the work that they're doing with the, with those young people isn't valued. And I suppose the other aspect of of that comment that that, that was in in the 2019 report was around um, additional support needs teachers and there's made, sorry additional support needs um, assistance. There was maybe a little bit of that coming through in um, Angela Morgan's um, report that was talking about the need to invest in professional learning um, for um, you know for people support assistance for there to be I suppose an enhancement of the status of that role for us to be looking at around remuneration. Of that, because quite frankly, the the the, the pay that, that that cohort of staff receive is is you know paltry, and um, when you think about the, the 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 skills that they have and the importance of the work that they're doing, but again, that work is predominantly done it is predominantly done by by women, um, 
And so we were beginning to get a sense at that time that you know maybe there was something in the the the, the gendered nature of that that um, you know that that cohort of the workforce that you know could could there be some correlation between this this lack of this lack of status, lack of value, um, poor remuneration for a really important job, and the fact that the majority of that work is carried out by women. So we were beginning to ask some questions around that. Okay, I, I think Mr. Muir wants to come in, and I'll, I'll come back briefly. Thanks, Convener. It's, it, it's just very briefly in response to uh, Andrea's point there about the status of the PSAs. I mean, I think we all recognise the wonderful job that many do in supporting children and young people with additional support needs. In, in other uh, jurisdictions, uh, teaching councils have begun to register uh, PSAs as a means of improving that status, understanding, and a demonstration of value. But also importantly, something that was picked up earlier on, uh, registration with it brings requirements to engage in professional learning. And again, registration would allow PSAs uh, to, to gain that, that uh, from that particular benefit. Uh, were that to be the case in Scotland, it's currently not. Ms. Wishart, are you content to move on? Content to move on, yes. Thanks, Convener. Thank you. Can we move to Ms. Mackay, please? Uh, and I still have two other members wanting to ask questions, and we are running up against time. So if we could try to be um, succinct in questions and answers, um, that would be fantastic. I'll bring Ms. Mackay in first. Thank you, convener. Yeah, this this you know points of this have been covered already, so maybe we could just keep this brief. It's just I'm wondering how how far um, the panel think a universally designed system can meet the needs of all learners. I'm I'm interested in the balance of specialist and universal support, and um, Andrea has has talked about that. Also, Andrea mentioned a, a sort of wall of red tape when teachers try to access um, more support. And, and how far can teachers, um, you know, differentiate in the classroom, or do they have to stick to um, a local authority plan? Um, you know, how much autonomy do they have? Um, Andrea, maybe you, you want to ask, answer first. Yeah, I'll bring in Miss Bradley. Perfect. In terms of in terms of um, curriculum and assessment, you know, the a cornerstone principle of curriculum for excellence is teacher professional judgment and autonomy in relation to these matters. And of course, you know, um we, we, we would we would see it that teachers should not be shouldn't be acting alone. You know, I Eileen painted quite a you know quite a I suppose a bleak picture of initial teacher education whereby teachers are being set up to be, you know, the, the, the sort of like solitary heroes of the hour, you know, not 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 as though they are one of a team around around the child. You know, I, I, I know it's a cliched a cliched phrase. But, but albeit that teachers do have a degree of professional autonomy around curriculum assessment, etc., they are. We, we want teachers to have the time to collaborate with colleagues, to learn from colleagues, and that kind of speaks to what was being talked about earlier, just a little bit earlier around the empowerment agenda, which which is supposed to be about enabling greater collaboration, not just among teachers, but between teachers and other partners, and among other partners th themselves, all in the interests of learning and teaching and individual children and young people. So in terms of in terms of the, the, the extent to which teachers can differentiate, that is that is a, a, an integral part of um, you know teaching, learning and assessment. Uh, yeah, you have to you have to differentiate um, in the way that you um, choose resources, choose the material to teach, choose what assessment methodology you're going to use, choose the way that you're going to give feedback to young people or indeed encourage them to give feedback to one another um, or, or, or self-assess. So there's differentiation is, is built into that. That, that, that. There isn't really like prescription around um, you know, what has to be taught, when it has to be taught, how it has to be taught, or certainly there shouldn't be, and we would be very concerned to learn to learn if that was teachers' experience because of you know local authority direction, or indeed if it was direction from direction from um, you know school management teams. We, we would want to see teacher professional autonomy at the heart of of how they work, but also with an element of collaboration around that. And just to go back to the the original question that um, Miss Mackay asked there um, about this relationship between inclusive pedagogy and and understanding knowledge and understanding of specific needs i think it's both you know just to reiterate i think it has to be both of those okay, okay mr Muir, then i'll come back to miss mckay 
Yeah, I think Ms Mackay raises a really interesting point here, which I tried to address right at the outset about the, the bigger questions that Angela Morgan's report is asking us around you know, what, what kind of education system do we want going forward. Uh, you know, she talks about uh, learning for life being the aspiration and everything that then flows from that uh, really up for consideration. And it, it ties in with what the, uh, the International Council on uh, Education Advisors uh, have suggested as well about a universally designed system that embraces all children and young people from the start, as opposed to a system that uh, is, is fit for the majority of pupils. And those with additional support needs are additions to that system. Mm -hmm. So we talked a lot earlier there about a mindset shift in Scottish education. I think we're undergoing that mindset shift just now. And I think teachers uh, to an individual are determined to do the very best for all of the children in their class. Uh, I think the, 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 the difficulty is one of resourcing. Uh, and I also include time within that, because as I said earlier, uh, giving time for student teachers, probationers and teachers who are in service to be able to gain the skills and the knowledge and the understanding that allows them to deal with the full range of young people is, is critically important. And, and it's also the, the question Ms. Mackay asks is also about what we value in education. And I think part of the, the, the shift that we're going through just now, we're seeing it very explicitly just now in the context of SQA. You know, are we are we a system that places greater importance on young people as they become older, because there is a view that that is how that system we have just now is predicated, or are, are we recognising that kind of uh, universal design that ICA are looking at, and, and recognising uh, that we need to build the system up for, for all children and young people from the outset, and make sure that teachers are skilled in dealing with the full range of young people that they've got in their schools. Thank Ms. Pryor, do you want to come in? Thank you. Yeah, I would. I would just echo what Ken has said. That actually, the, that this comes down to a fundamental question um, about what we want education to be. Um, and the point that I made early on about our deficit uh, model, um, which says that a child with additional support needs is a drag um, on attainment. Um, and that our system actually is about producing um, you know, young people for the university system. And if you're not in that category, then frankly, um, you know, we'll just entertain you with drawings. Um, you know, that, that's, that's obviously uh, not the case all the time. But you know, there, there is a mindset that in some schools, it has to be said, that if you know our purpose is to get young people through their qualifications, that is our purpose. So as long as we have folk within the system who see that as the purpose of our education system, we're going to struggle. So we have to reset. Um, what is this about? What is this for? Because um, in my mind, as a as a parent. Um, actually, it's about preparing young people for their future, um, to sustain themselves and to be contributing adults, um, to support them to be that. Um, for some, that will mean qualifications in university, but for a whole lot more, it will mean other things. So we have to reset our, our, our approach and our aspiration for young people. Thank you. Um, can we move to questions from Mr. Green, please? Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Uh, I won't take up too much of your time. I know we're, we're short on time, but um, just before the, the COVID lockdowns, uh, uh, I managed to squeeze in a visit to a school uh, and uh, sit in and take part in a, a secondary school class uh, in my region on the West Coast. And uh, at one point, I had a private conversation with the teacher, and she basically said that the problem she'd had is that she had a double, double whammy or triple whammy of being a school in, a, in, a, in an area where there was a higher proportion of additional support needs pupils in the school in general, uh, for, for a wide range of reasons. Um, the, the, the size of the classroom itself was a challenge, and also she had lost uh, a classroom assistant. Uh, which meant that around a third of the pupils in her class were uh, additional pony students. 
Uh, and she said that she went home at night and, and the biggest thing that she felt was guilt because she felt guilt that she was neither giving enough t attention to those with additional support needs to help them have a, a, a meaningful uh, classroom experience, but equally guilt that those who uh, she felt she wasn't able to spend one-to-one -one time with to, to help them and push them further. So I guess the problem is, and I know I know we've talked a lot about resource and money and, and who's responsible for what, and uh, that's an internal uh, conversation that we have on the committee. But I, I do wonder, you know, what immediate things could we do to alleviate the situation for teachers who, are, who clearly are struggling, not in every circumstance, but in circumstances, certainly in, in some parts of the country. Uh, I'm not seeing any of the panel members indicating they want to. Oh, yep, yeah, uh, we've got two now. Um, so I'll go to Ms. Fadley first, then Mr. Muir. Thank you. I think in the in the very short term, there could be an honesty about additional support needs provision and the lack of um, adequate resourcing for it. I think that certainly our members um, expressed frustration when the when the, the the remit of the review was made. You know, was made known that it wasn't going to that the review itself wasn't going to be looking at resources because the EIS for a long long number of years had been raising with government, national government, local government, and anybody else who would listen um, about the concerns that our members had about under resourcing. And we were reluctant initially to, to, to give our support within the um, Agassel group, as it, as it was formerly known, uh, for the for the um, you know for the review, review to go ahead because we thought that it would be stalling. It would be stalling on a question that we already knew the answer to. Um, and, and in the interim, what, I think what um, what um, Jamie Green has described there is a really common experience among among teachers. Um, in mainstream education, who just feel that they are not able to do the best that they want to do by the young people and by the parents, and you know, by by the by the their, their school communities, and that's a really demoralising um, position to be in. And I think that I think that while while this question of resources is being looked at, and hopefully is going to be looked at with a, a, a ma as a matter of urgency and resolved as a matter of urgency, at least we can be honest with teachers that this is not. That, 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 that it's not their fault that they cannot attend to all of these things at the same time in large class sizes uh, while they're on um, you know uh, uh, among the, the high um, within the OECD in terms of um, class contact and not enough time to, to, to spend on preparation engaging in the professional learning that um, you know that, 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 that Ken talked about and that I've talked about it's an array of issues and there an array of interrelated issues but I think that to be honest with teachers, up front here and now would, would go some way to, to addressing some of those questions around morale. Yeah, Mr Muir and then Ms Burnett. Yeah, I think uh, Mr Green's experience with that teacher, as Andrea suggested, has characterised the feelings that many teachers have got. You know, they want to do their very best, but they're unable to. Uh, and I think in, as an immediate response to a teacher in that situation, my advice has always been to, to reassure them that they, they are not the sole solution to the problem, and that uh, you know, head teacher and uh, senior leaders within the school should be supporting that teacher to, to uh, find other, other support mechanisms. Uh, and that might be services out with the school coming in to support the, the, the children and young people, particularly where they lose a PSA or, the, or, the, or they are in an area of high disadvantage with a large number of children requiring additional support needs. But it goes back to what I said earlier about you know it's very easy to uh, to, to to suggest that the, the teacher in the classroom or the school uh, or indeed the local authority itself is a solution to the problem. I think it's much more about the integrated support that's available so that. These children and young people with the additional support needs are, are, are better able to learn from the experience that they get in the classroom from teachers because of the support that they and the family are getting elsewhere. Ms. Burnett, I just wanted to kind of take a different slant on it and look at it. The parents are aware that it's the teachers' hands are effectively tied, and what they can and can they can they can achieve in a class. But I look at it as another perspective. We've got a community out there that support schools. We need to stop looking for the school being the problem and it just being a wee insular bubble. It needs to be looked at a more community based outward approach going inward. So that therefore you've got parents who are really upskilled because they understand the complex need of some children with additional support needs. It could be children who have physical disabilities and they understand their, their, their own children's conditions. It's about 
using their skill set and the community skill set and all those charitable organisations or community organisations and allowing them to come into a school. And I totally understand pre-COVID that was great. And I know there's so many challenges we now face because of the impact of COVID and the fact you cannot go into a school. But there must be other platforms and mechanisms that we can then support teachers. There's lots of voluntary organisations out there with great depths of knowledge and skill sets, even if it comes back down to resources. A teacher should never walk away from a class thinking, I failed that child. We all have a duty and a responsibility. Again, as I'm, I keep reiterating, it's about partnership. We should all be working together. We all bring our own individual skills to the table. And it's about forming that picture, using that Angela Morgan's review and the re recommendations taken forward to ensure that going forward, we should not ever have be in a position where a teacher goes, I failed that child, or I failed multiple children. And it shouldn't be for a parent to think, I can't support my child, I don't know where else to go. So walls are slowly coming down, but we have to be clear. Effective communication, even right down to translation of information, remove the jargon, make it transparent, and make sure that the jigsaw becomes a whole jigsaw and not the fragmented one that we're currently uh, experiencing. I'm going to go back to Mr. Green, and I know Mr. Um, uh, Clear possibly has another question. But very, very briefly, we're really tight for time now, Mr. Green. Well, I've been very patient, convener. <laughs> um, so the other question I had was around. Obviously, this has been an unusual year uh, with, with uh, COVID, with many parents homeschooling and teachers uh, trying their very best to get around everyone in their class virtually, uh, and indeed look after some pupils in the class. How do we uh, how do we help uh, that recovery as we emerge uh, from COVID? Given that many uh, young people with additional support needs will have been at home uh, uh, and will may have, maybe have missed that one-to-one -one interaction with the teacher that, that that they need most. Okay, I'm going to miss, bring Mr. Greer in to ask his question as well, and hopefully we can wrap them up with final answers, Mr. Greer. Thanks, Convener. Yeah, it's just going back to the previous discussion on pupil support assistance, and particularly what Andrea said. Um, should a pupil support assistant who is assigned specifically to work with a child with additional support needs be required to have some kind of qualification in additional support needs? Um, I recognise what's been said before about um, how that, that should justify greater remuneration, etc. But if we're saying that these are assistants designated to support children with additional needs, should they have? Should there be a requirement for some level of training or qualification in that? Yeah, I'll go to Miss Pryor and then to Miss Burnett. Once to Mr. Greer's question, um, I think that the, the you know the situation is very patchy um, in terms of the training and uh, qualifications of additional support needs assistance, or they're called different things in local different local authorities. Um, I would certainly say that, that parents have an expectation that if an individual is working with their child, um, whether it's a, a, a disability or whether it's uh, a learning difficulty or, or whatever it is, um, actually that individual has um, a clear understanding of strategies to work with that child. So it does come down to the, they should have specific training um, and learning opportunities um, so that when they're undertaking that role, they actually are, are, are able to do it effectively. Um, on a more general point, I suppose I would I would just say that that you know I, I bring us back to what Angela Morgan um, said in her report that actually we need a, a, a mindset shift um, which says that children and young people who have additional support needs are not a problem, and that actually um, those within schools within local authorities. Um, Require to have a, a much uh, much more inclusive approach to young people and to their parents and their families, um, and that the purpose of education, the purpose of what we do, um, whether it's it's you know um, in school or elsewhere, is to support that young person in their growth and development as an individual. Certainly, the work that we've done over the, the, the pandemic time, the surveys we have run, um, have thrown up some really 
horrific stories from families where um, young people have effectively been abandoned, uh, families who have said they have had no contact, uh, they do not know who to contact, they cannot phone the school, they are completely out of the loop, families who have talked about the fact that their child is so distressed by being out of school because of their condition that actually they have become violent um, and uh, their behaviour has become unmanageable and it is because they are out of school and their routine and their, their everyday life has been so disrupted. So if it has been difficult for us um, as adults to deal with COVID, just think how it is for, for some young people. So the, 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 rec the question was about recovery. Um, one of the things that we asked uh, way back was that, that as we go back to school and as, as children resume their classroom learning, then actually there have to be um, detailed conversations with families about how it has been, how the learning has been, what issues have arisen, what support they need to move forward, because we are not in the same place we were 10 months ago when this all started. Things have changed within families. Um, and Professionals within schools have to understand the experience, the lived experience of families, and that very much echoes what Angela Morgan said in her report. Thank you. We're right up against time, so I'm going to bring in Miss Burney and finally Miss Bradley. Thank you. It was just to cover both points, Mayor. So on recovery, we have to be really clear that currently the opinion is that every child in Scotland now has an additional support need due to the impact of the pandemic and whatever trauma they have faced, whether it be not seeing their friends, going into school, going outside, or family bereavement, illness, there's multiple mitigations there that will play a role in how a child will cope going back to school. As I mentioned earlier, I am a parent. First and foremost, I have a child with additional support needs. I totally understand the challenges faced trying to remote learn, distance learn with a child who really struggles. And I know that even going forward as part of a recovery plan, I know that the expectation is me and my parent that my child would not be able to go back to school initially full time. It would need to be over a period of time because of the significant impact on the way that they learn and the way they adapt and, and obviously the change that that brings about. But it's not saying that it can't be done. It can, it can be. And it's just about finding and being aware that the education landscape has significantly changed. Nobody knows what's around the corner. When the report was written, it was a more clear, defined pathway. Now, with COVID, it has brought about so many changes. So it's about how we work together to ensure transition, because transition is key. This is a new phase of transition that previously did not exist. We never had a pandemic to transition from. So it's ensuring that we set up the right strategies for support for all, not even just children with additional support needs, but for all children, for parents and carers, and for staff. Uh, to make that a complete picture. Um, on pupil support assistance, sorry, just one wee quick word on the pupil support. I agree there needs to be some sort of um, qualification or at least an acknowledgement that they have got a recognition of some prior experience of working with somebody who has an additional support need uh, moving forward. Okay, and finally, I will bring in Ms Bradley, and I note Ms Sermier has put a comment um, for members in the chat, if they could look to that. Um, Ms Bradley, finally, thanks. Um, on the question around um, um, support assistance, then, yeah, we, we would say that, yeah, um, there should be professional learning and potentially qualifications to be undertaken by, by that cohort of the workforce. International evidence shows that the, you know, the more qualified, the more um, sort of like initial education that professionals have within education, the better the outcomes for, for young people. So, yes, um, but, but within that, I think that we would also have to recognise the, the wealth of experience that is pre-existing within that cohort of, of, of the workforce. So I think that we would need to, if we were going to look at creating something around that, it would need to be as inclusive as possible rather than exclude people um, on the basis of um, qualifications acquisition. You know, we would need to look at experiential um, learning and um, accreditation uh, within that as well. In terms of recovery, well, we, we were clear after the first lockdown that, that on um, the, the reopening of schools, there had to be um, particular attention paid to the young people who had been most disadvantaged by the first lockdown. They were, of course, the the poorest young people and those who have um, additional support needs, and we urged there to be, um, you know, in the spirit of the recovery curriculum, 
time spent on health and well-being and not this kind of like you know business as usual resumption of a business as usual approach it's really really important that that is understood when we emerge from 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 this lockdown and what will be a what I would imagine will be quite a lengthy period of, of education recovery thereafter we need to think about um, recruiting additional teachers to work with the young people who have been most disadvantaged by by the covid um, experience so we've suggested for example that all supply teachers who are currently um out of contract, be contracted for at least a year in order that they can be part of that recovery effort and, and working with young people with additional needs and again others who have been disproportionately impacted by COVID um, you know, would be would be a, a key area for them. For example, around mentorship of those young people. Um, around supporting their health and well being, maybe maybe um helping them further with blended learning that they could do out with the, the you know the classroom the face to face classroom experience um, throughout the, the period of recovery. We also have to look at class sizes. Again the points that I made about the time that teachers have to spend with individual young people, that's going to be absolutely critical to the recovery phase um, and beyond. Um, and I think that that's probably everything that I would say about that at this point. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you. Huge thank you to all our panel members this morning. Very really helpful um, session. Um, we are right up against time, so I'm going to move very quickly on, um, just to spend for 30 seconds or so, and move to our second panel. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome back. We now move to our second panel of witnesses for today. And can I welcome to your committee, Mr. Gray, who has been able to join us um, for the second panel. Um, I could ask members if they do have questions, if they could indicate by putting an R in the chat. Um, but I know that um, Ms. Wishart has one from the previous session. I'll go to her first. So could I welcome Jennifer King, Education Manager, ASN Educational Psychology and Inclusion and representative of the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland, and Laura Ann Curry, Head of Inclusion, Wellbeing and Equality Education Scotland. Uh, and I bring in Ms. Wishart first, please. Yeah. Thank you, convener. I was just waiting for the mic to go on. Um, uh, in the a question that I asked the, the, the previous panel, um, in terms of resources and looking at information about budgets and spending, how can spending on ASL be, be identified? And uh, in, uh, you know, looking at the local authority finance retur returns, and and how volatile do you think that spending is? Uh, can I go to Miss King first, and then I'll go to Miss Curry? Yes. Um, thank you, Miss Wishart, for your question. Um, with regard to the, um, I can I can give a, a partial answer to to that, um, and there's maybe further work that needs to be done with regard to um, the work which Audit Scotland undertook and was paused due to the pandemic. Um, the the financial returns which um, each local authority make with regard to additional support for learning, um, and some of that information obviously has been included in the annual reports to Parliament um, over the past ten years. But there will be there'll be um it'll give there are some broad indicators in there, but obviously there will be some variation because as we know the delivery of additional support for learning and the structures and the way in which local authorities are are organized 
um, do differ, and they differ because the demographics, obviously, you know, from a, a rural authority to a, um, a very urban one, will will vary. So, um, and just the way the structures, the workforce, um, and the some of the complexities and the variation across the local authorities will therefore be reflected in some of those um, financial returns. Um, my 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 view as a as a manager within a local authority and the um, the colleagues that I speak with, I don't think I would describe the funding and the resourcing in relation to additional support for learning as volatile. Um, I think that it's something that we um, constantly keep under review. Um, it's it's an area that yes, where there's significant pressures. Um, it's an uh, and I think the final point I would make that in any um, learning that we take forward with regard to what's going to be meaningful in terms of um, the you know how we look at financial returns, um, it must be better aligned to um, outcomes for um, and a more meaningful outcome reporting framework with regard to additional support for learning. And I'll probably return to that theme quite a lot in some of my responses. Um, so I think that's probably as far as I can um, respond to your question at the moment. Okay, Miss um, Curry. Yeah, uh, thank you and um, welcome. <laughs> um, um, I oh, Jennifer's obviously in a better position to answer that question in relation to finance. Um, I would um, agree um, and reinforce um, the need to link um, the finance um, and how we use that in relation to um, overall need, but also in relation to outcomes. Um, and as Angela Morgan has highlighted in her report, um, we haven't always um, and still haven't um, managed to crack that um, area around um, what are meaningful outcomes for children with additional support needs. And in fact, many of the um, uh, learning outcomes that children with additional support needs achieve are not necessarily valued um, uh, because they're not measured. And that's certainly something that Education Scotland have been in discussion with ADES around and with ASLIG um, to look at how we can actually improve that. And I think that will provide some data um, to inform um, where resources uh, need to be um, um, uh, diverted or um, uh, increased or um, used more e effectively. And I think um, a wider discussion around what we mean by resources is required because resources is not just about getting more people, and I know that you'll all be aware of that, um, but it is about how do we actually deploy those resources most effectively, and that then comes back to the outcome side of things. If we're deploying them effectively, then we should achieve better outcomes for all children um, and those with additional support needs. I think um, we also need to think about um, how we creatively use some of those resources. And I know that happens in education authorities um, from our inspection evidence over a, a long period of time. Um, authorities um, are very creative in, in using specialist provisions and special schools staff um, to um, support mainstream um, um, uh, teachers um, using uh, giving the advice and um, being able to um, share um, resources that's, that are used in special schools um, and coaching and mentoring uh, mainstream teachers. So that's just an example of how a resource, which is essentially a special school resource, can actually be seen in a wider um, context. Um, so I think all of that needs to be taken into uh, consideration, um, I think, as well, in terms of professional learning. That is a resource. It's a resource to inform teachers um, across special and, and mainstream sectors. So I'm sure we'll come back to many of those issues um, during um, this discussion, but uh, I think it's a very complex one in, in previous um, people that you were talking to, I think, highlighted some of that. But I would just like to uh, to reinforce the fact that you know, resources is not just about putting extra money in. Uh, it has to be linked to more e to effective outcomes. And we need to think creatively about how we use those resources, particularly in the context that we're currently working in. And Angela Morgan's um, uh, plea to look at uh, mainstream schooling more holistically and as a lifelong learning um, uh, activity. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. And apologies, we don't have you, uh, a camera for you at the moment, Miss Curry. Miss um, Bishop, did you want to come back in? No, that's fine. If 
I know others have got plenty of questions. Okay, I'll go to Mr. Gibson first of all, please. Um, maybe just one question and a supplementary, Mr. Gibson, if possible. For very okay, time. thank you. Right, thanks very much, uh, convener, and good morning, uh, panel. Uh, there's an understandable presumption of mainstream. I'm just wondering where the boundaries uh, should be drawn. Uh, um, has, for example, cost been a factor in mainstreaming, being less expensive than having special schools? And uh, Ms King spoke of outcomes. Have outcomes for children who are now mainstreamed who previously would not have been improved? Thank you. I'll go to Ms King first of all, please. Okay, thank you for your question, Mr Gibson. So I think there was two parts to it. One with regard to boundaries or limitations perhaps around mainstreaming and one to do with outcomes. Um, I don't. I think that again, some of the answers that the previous panel gave around um, and um, you know taking a more holistic approach to this. Um, I don't think that they're. Um, I don't think we can define those boundaries. Um, I think it's helpful if we use the themes that were um, uh, referred to in the most recent presumption of mainstreaming report with regard to um, looking at children and young people's participation, their support, their achievement. So it will inevitably be tied to outcomes. But it will always come down to. Um, uh, I think the other area that we need to we need to um, probably make greater use of when we at, when we consider that question um, are um, local authorities' accessibility strategies. Um, and um, if we look at um, the extent to which children um, are um, included in their local community and their local um, school, then um, how accessible the curriculum the physical environment um, and the communication, which are the three factors that we look at with regard to um, um, accessibility, are really relevant. Um, and therefore, the bound so the boundaries, if you like, can sometimes come down to, for example, um, there are some buildings that, um, that that there are upper limits, if you like, in how how far we can adapt the learning environment, just because of the um, factors related to them. Um, but um, we're in the process of um, many of us of um, you know with new buildings, and we're continuing to build new schools, and we have to take into account, therefore, um, the how accessible with regard to those three factors I mentioned um, inclusion is. So, um, and presumption of mainstreaming, and indeed the Additional Support for Learning Act, um, both of those consider children with additional support needs to be on a continuum, um, and that continuum. Um, it relates to you know un universal um, provision through to additionality and targeted support that may be provided in um, a local school and nursery and its community, um, through to where there is specialist provision. And of course, not all local authorities necessarily have special schools because of their demographics. So I don't think that there can be um, a, a boundary as such, but I think we have to revisit, if you like. Um, where the um, the themes with regard to pre um, presumption of um, mainstreaming that I refer to, and the factors for accessibility um, interrelate, if you like, um, and um, and and that that always gives us in local authorities a guide, if you like, um, and looking at children as individuals within that, alongside obviously. Um, Cohorts of children as well, because we have to look at um, uh, uh, you know children in their in their in their communities. And as far as outcomes are concerned, um, I think um, the, the reason that that's one of the key recommendations in Angela Morgan's report is that um, our reporting, if you like, for children with additional support needs has had limitations to it um, over over the past few years. The um, there. ASLIG, which I'm a member of, as is um, Laura Ann Curry and some of the previous panel members, um, um, as an organisation or as a group, is working towards with um, our government colleagues in, in looking at how the national improvement framework can um, be more inclusive, can better represent the considerable achievements of children with additional support needs, particularly those with complex needs. Um, but Currently, we report, as everyone is aware, um, when we look at the, um, the reporting in, in August, particularly for senior fees, we report on what is a relatively um, uh, restricted um, performance, if you like, of pupils. That date, the, the wider data is, is within the system. We, there are children who achieve um, you know, a wide range of accredited qualifications um, within the SQA framework. But we don't report on them, and and that that has to be a significant change, and it it relates to the point which I think which Eileen Pryor made previously, 
um, <clears throat> that it's about um, what we value, um, what we want for young people, what additional support for learning should achieve for a young person as they move into adult life. Schools and local authorities are responsible for young people from um, uh, uh, you know, birth to 18, um, but um, young people um, move into adult life at that point largely. And, um, what we want for them in terms of outcomes when they become adults is what we should be trying to achieve through the years that they're they're in school. So an outcomes framework that is much more meaningful than it currently is at the moment, um, I think, would be would help us answer the question that you have asked, which um, uh, we can only partially answer at the moment. Thank you, Miss Curry. Yes, um, two points um, to um, what's already been said. Um, I think when we're looking at um, um, what the children, we start from a child's needs um, at, all, at all times. So it's not a case of saying um, mainstream um, is, um, is is all that we're going to consider. We need to look at the child in the round uh, or the young person in the round and say what does this child actually require, and then from that position we then look at so therefore. What is the best um, inter set of interventions um, that we can offer in order to meet those needs? And those needs will change over time. They'll be different for different children, and um, children may move in and out um, of um, provisions, starting with mainstream um, or um, uh, and. <coughs> um, from the mainstream, um, maybe uh, spending some time um, in a unit, um, a specialist unit, to get specific interventions um, that are more focused and, and specific, or um, as I said before, teachers um, and <clears throat> others may come in from other resources in order to provide um, that support. So it's not just a question about should um, all children will be accommodated within mainstream. It's we'll look at what the child's needs are and then we'll determine what is best to meet those needs. And that's not just done within um, a school setting. We have systems and processes in place like GERFIC and, um, and like um, the stage intervention that accompanies the Additional Support for Learning Act, which outlines how we go about identifying those needs um, and how we determine um, over time how those needs change and whether they increase or decrease. So it's not a one size fits all. It's very complex. It should be very complex. Um, it should involve other agencies um, to support us in identifying the needs, so speech and language therapy, physiotherapy, um, community learning and development, um, youth services, because when we're talking about additional support needs, we're, we're talking about children who are care experienced, children who have had adverse childhood experiences, gypsy travellers. Um, uh, it's a wide range of children that would be categorised um, under the, the Act. So the, my first point is, is that Let's look at what children's needs are um, and uh, and provide for them rather than think about is it mainstream or special. Second point I would want to say is just in terms of that whole concept of um, uh, inclusion, um, in, inclusion um, which sometimes results in inclusion meaning mainstream education. Um, but of course, given my previous response, um, it's much more than that. Um, but all of the research evidence will demonstrate that um, uh, children um, who experience um, um, an inclusive um, environment um, actually um, go on um, and generally to do much better. Um, and I think it's important, Jennifer touched on this about this is about lifelong learning. Um, children and young people who have additional support needs grow up in communities. Um, and I think it says it takes a village to raise a, a child. Um, we need to, to think about what are the experiences that our children with additional support needs are getting, um, and in a mainstream setting, they are being exposed um, to that um, lifelong learning approach, but they are also being exposed um, to um, their local community and what happens within their community and the supports they will need when they move and transition out of school into um, uh, Further education or, or, or work. So um, that's one of the reasons why, um, in the research, um, the, uh, the idea of, of, of um, mainstreaming um, is held so strongly. And I would also like to add to that that um, in Scotland, as part of the European Agency for, Special, for the Inclusion of Special 
needs. Uh, I don't like that term, but that's what they're um, called, what, what they refer to um, additional support needs as. And we, they promote inclusion, they promote um, um, many of the approaches that we already do in Scotland. And in fact, we're held um, as um, a very good example um, of this. Um, from a policy and guidance perspective, um, I think we would agree that implementation is, is something that we are building and strengthening um, um, as we go through. And Angela Morgan's report will probably will help us to do that. So, thank you. Mr. Gibson, I take on board what's been said about looking at the child in the round and their individual uh, needs uh, and uh, their backgrounds, etc. But just in this mainstreaming criteria, accepting what uh, Jennifer King said about, um, you know, accessibility, for example, in terms of mainstreaming criteria, is it the same across Scotland that 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 young people are judged against, or is it very much a subjective postcode lottery? In other words, would someone perhaps be mainstreamed in Edinburgh who wouldn't be in Ayrshire or Glasgow, or is you know what what criteria is operated on when, when one considers whether a child should be mainstreamed or not? I'll go to Miss King again first. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't. Um, I don't think that it's a, a postcode lottery. I think that, um, I, as I'd referred to in my previous answer, that um, the, the, the demographics, for example, will always have some some influence. I mean, and, and as I'd said, there are some local authorities, particularly in the more rural um, areas, um, but not exclusively, where there are not standalone special schools, um, and therefore um, uh, the, the, the the support for that child or young person or those children. Um, will be in um, in a local school, albeit with um, uh, the, um, the the specialisms and the enhanced support being um, uh, provided within that community setting. Um, so I don't know that it's necessarily a, a, a postcode lottery. Um, and as far as the criteria are concerned, well, we have a code of practice and digital support for learning code of practice, which provides us with broad criteria. Um, the, the factors giving rise to children's additional support needs is a starting point for, um, for, for determining the extent to which a child has additional support needs. Um, and, and that sits alongside um, the ongoing um, assessment um, of learning and teaching that teachers and um, those who work with them um, carry out on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and, and of course, for some children and young people, that happens um, before they come to school. So um, there are there are broad criteria there. Yes, um, uh, I, I think one of the areas that has um, perhaps slightly complicated the, lands, the landscape, um, and there's been reference made to that with regard to planning. But we we obviously um, um, assess and um, uh, children's wider well-being and the well-being indicators, sometimes referred to as the Shinari indicators, which came with the introduction of um, GERFEC, um, provide us, if you like, with a more holistic um, view of a, of, a, of a child and the support that they need within their family and their community. And within that, we have some children who have additional support needs um, and the, the factors that give rise to those, um, which which map on to some extent to the well-being indicators. So, um, it, 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 there will be some variation between authorities simply because of their demographics, but we have got um, frameworks which support um, staff um, across local authorities to do that in a um, common way, if you like. Okay, Thank you. Karen? Um, I don't think I've got very much more to add to that. I was already made reference to the Code of Practice and the staged intervention, so I agree that there are frameworks um, that, that help to make um, decision-making more consistent. Um, However, um, I, I would agree that um, and, and much of that is dependent on um, what resources um, and provisions are provided um, within each individual authority, which um, are quite can be quite different. But that doesn't necessarily. Uh, that I'm not making any evaluative statement about that. They're different because of the context in which local authorities. Um, Work um, and whether they're rural or, or urban, um, etc. Um, so it, I would I disagree that it's a, a postcode um, lottery. I think sometimes um, we hear from parents that um, uh, you know if I was in Edinburgh, I would get individual 
I'm just using that as an example. This is not the case. But if I was in this authority, I would get speech and language therapy um, for my child. Um, um, and, uh, <clears throat> and sometimes, um, you know, we need to look beyond what schools provide. But yes, there are differences in how allied health professionals deliver their service. So in one authority, it might be um, through building capacity within a class teacher to, pro to, to provide some of that speech and language therapy integrated into the literacy curriculum. Um, and so the speech and language therapists will be working with a class teacher, um, advising and consulting around individual children within that class. In another authority, it might be a health board, it might be delivered on a one-to-one -one, um, basis with a child. So there are differences in the way in which um, provisions are provided, um, but that doesn't necessarily make them um, um, ineffective or, or not relevant. Um, or, or, um, and it can be perceived as a postcode lottery when, in fact, there are justifiable reasons why it's delivered in the way that it is. That is just one example of why you might hear that from parents. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, convener. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. I'd move on to Mr. Mundell. Thank you, convener. Um, I wanted to, to follow on really from, from that issue, and I'm, I'm particularly interested in uh, how ASN support is delivered in smaller schools for those uh, who are in mainstream. Um, and firstly, whether you recognise that provision can be patchy um, and that, that teachers in the classroom can be under an awful lot of pressure, uh, particularly in single teacher schools. Ms. King. Uh, thank, thank you for your question, Mr. Mundell. Um, I, I think, again, um, the You've, you, you've referred to it as being patchy. Um, I, th I think there, as we've referred to in previous answers, that there are differences necessarily because of. Um, so a, a small rural community school, yes, will have to um, have its support delivered to some extent, if you like, or provided um, somewhat differently to um, um, in a small urban authority such as the one I work in in Dundee. Um, I think that, um, therefore, the, the the partnership, if you like, between that um, that school, for example, or, or, or rural community schools, and the central services, for example, that um, that, that um, will exist to some extent, is really important. Um, how they're supported um, to build the capacity um, with the the workforce, teachers, and um, support staff. Um, is is critical um, in a in a small um, rural school. Um, I, I it, there are um, considerable expectations, if you like, I suppose, um, with regard to um, um, a single teacher in that in that respect. Um, I would I, I would I would argue that you you've got somebody who ha has um, therefore developed immense experience and skills in being able to. Um, uh, work in such a, a flexible way. Um, I think that the um, one of the, the themes which um, came up with the previous panel, and um, and again Angela Morgan referred to it in her her report, is that if we um, if we continue to address additional support needs um, as children with categories, whether it's those with at the moment we categorise in terms of. Um, autism and um, uh, ADHD, um, social and communication needs, um, and so on. That I think is um, unhelpful. Um, I, I understand that labels can be can be very helpful for families in many circumstances. It can be a shortcut to understanding um, a, a, a child's development and their behaviour. However, um, from a, a, a provision perspective and a support perspective, um, it, it can be perceived, if you like, as having a number of children with very, very different needs, when in fact there are commonalities, if you like, and underpinning factors for those additional support needs, communication, social communication being probably the most important one. So I think that the, the support for, in particular, um, schools and rural communities has to be a strong partnership between um, not just teachers and not just the support staff and not just the head teacher, but the central staff who support them. Um, Laura Ann referred to um, others such as community learning and development, allied health professionals, um, all of which have to work in quite different ways currently. I think there's learning that will come out of um, the pandemic in terms of um, uh, how the um, the virtual support um, we've, we've got 
you know, small, um, uh, or should I say, case studies, I suppose, if you like, of how that's proving to be a very effective way of central ser services um, supporting where they can't make long journeys, for example, um, at the moment for good reason. But I think those will be aspects that will remain. So um, I think there are opportunities and challenges, if you like, particularly for for, for rural schools and rural uh, rural communities. Ms. Curry. Um, I'll maybe broaden um, the discussion a little bit there, because um, obviously um, Ms. King has um, um, discussed uh, from uh, an education authority perspective. In terms of Education Scotland, um, um, we would be trying to provide support um, for all teachers um, uh, through our professional learning activities, um, and also in relation to um, some of the um, um, signposting that we do in, in terms of um, uh, alerting teachers to new resources which are coming out that might support them um, with individual children, um, uh, also third sector um, um, uh, uh, um, third sector organisations who can provide not just resources but um, in, some, in some cases help um, um, for teachers um, who find themselves um, working um, with um, Within a, uh, within a context that they don't feel particularly confident in. So, professional learning is a very important offer by Education Scotland, but together with that is obviously how we support some of the um, schools and individual teachers and authorities through um, our regional teams um, and through the regional collaboratives. Um, so, an example that you gave in terms of a single teacher um, in a rural location, um, that would be, um, if, if that was felt to be required by the, the regional collaboratives, then um, our regional teams would be able um, to provide some support to that individual teacher, but more likely to actually provide the support to um, the central staff, which Jennifer referred to, so that the central staff are, um, can then help an individual teacher within the context um, of their particular um, local authority um, and community. So there's a lot that Education Scotland um, offers um, in relation to that. The regional teams um, are an important part of that, um, um, an important part in terms of building the capacity within the system. So that in that single teacher school, if the teacher has a similar um, range of issues, um, then through that um, support, coaching, mentoring, working with central um, staff, scaffolding for the for the teacher approaches for that particular child, that's learning that can then be deployed um, um, in future contexts. Um, so I'm sure we'll come back to the whole um, notion of professional learning and how that's delivered, um, um, but that's how we would address some of those variabilities um, through a more systemic approach um, um, working, um, as I said, at that regional, local authority and school levels. Okay, thank you. Mr Mandel, do you want to come back in? Uh, to Laura and Curry, I, mean, I just I understand and hear what you're saying. It's not a question about about teachers' abilities or or, or skills. It's you know, I think in some cases you know, very experienced teachers are, are coming back you know, and, and saying that you know it's it's about cutbacks to you know to to you know additional support and about the capacity you have to to be flexible. You know if if, if there's only uh, you know if there's only one person. Um, you know, there, there to teach the young people. So I just wondered whether Education Scotland took a view, you know, on, on the kind of minimum level of support, you know, that could be expected, and you know, whether you recognise that, you know, in some local authorities, in some instances, you know, young people and their families are, are not getting the one-to-one -one support, uh, you know, that, that, that they would expect, and that, that most reasonable people, I think, would would want to see, including your know, teachers themselves, who are, who are trying to do their very best. Miss Kenny. Yeah. Sorry, we don't have Ms. Curry's sound. Sorry, we missed the start of that. Ms. Curry, could you start again? Okay, no problem. Um, yeah, Education Scotland um, wouldn't have a view on um, minimal um, uh, ratios in relation to teachers, etc. Um, what, as I said before, we'd be trying to um, support the authorities um, in supporting um, those situations, um, and some of that support might actually, as I said, be going in to work alongside um, a class teacher. 
um, it would be for local authorities um, to make judgments around um, what kind of support was required and, and whether or not it was sufficient um, to meet the needs of that individual child. You don't go back to local authorities and say that that isn't working, it's not a good approach or there's better practice elsewhere and you could think about doing it differently or is, what, what, what's the sort of nature of that conversation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, uh, uh, my our inspection colleagues um, would be able to give you a, a much fuller answer, and certainly I can follow that up. But through inspection, um, we would be identifying um, gaps um, in provision uh, and where there's good practice, um, and that information is fed back into the regional teams, and from there, um, priorities um, in terms of. Um, um, what developments and interventions are required would be agreed um, with the regional collaboratives, um, and we would target um, particular authorities or particular schools. And there are examples of where that's happening just now. So, Education Scotland um, um, a regional team is picking up on um, some um, inspection evidence um, in, a partic in particular schools um, where um, the provision wasn't felt to be satisfactory um, and we're working alongside the education um, authority senior staff responsible for additional support needs and um, working with them with the head teacher and senior leadership team of those particular schools so that's the way in which we would use the evidence that comes from inspection and um, to provide the support that's relevant for that particular authority and um, individual school um, we would also get evidence um, from our links um, with, um, uh, with uh, authority staff who are responsible for additional support needs. They will be doing their own self-evaluation in relation to individual schools, but also in terms of the policy and practice within the authority. And from the, that evaluation evidence, we would work alongside um, the authority to um, help um, uh, improve um, through an improvement planning process um, the issues that they've evaluated as being uh, as requiring further attention, further work. And again, there are examples of that um, already within um, the regional teams. So it's a good question. Um, and sorry, I didn't explain that um, in the original um, answer I gave to you. Okay, Miss King, you wanted to come in as well. Yes, I just thought I would come back um, um Laura Ann's points about um uh, the the support from um Education Scotland and the challenge. Um um the I, I chair a, the the National ADES network of those who have a similar role to mine. Um and we we provide um ADES provides um peer support and challenge to um local authorities particularly in relation to um, what provision for additional support for learning looks like. And that, that's a real mix from um, Shetland and Orkney and Highland to the bigger urban authorities. Um, and, and it's something that we're not complacent about. I mean, it's something that we have to continue to, to, um, to, to support and challenge one another on around what, what Allowing for context, and um, and and we had we had a, a recent network meeting um, where, in fact, that was the the focus of um, support and discussion for our members was around well, what and and challenging one another to know um, how 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 do we know that it's good enough and where are the gaps, um, and and back again, I suppose though that in knowing and being able to answer those questions, um, we 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 need to relate that to. Um, a more meaningful um, improvement framework, um, and um, and that that work is now fortunately underway. So, um, but I think I didn't want to. I suppose I just wanted to make the point that um, you know ADES um, provides internally, if you like, within its organisation, um, peer support and challenge, um, particularly in relation to this area. Thank you. Um, can I bring in Mr. Neil, please? I've got just two short questions. I'll ask them uh, at once to help with the time. And it's in relation to resources for additional support needs as well as the use of resources. And my two questions are, first of all, uh, given the relatively large percentage now of pupils who are designated as being in need of additional support needs, it has the time come for us to look again at how we define additional support needs and in particular to target resources at the most needy within that group, more so than is happening at the moment? And secondly, 
Uh, my experience is that uh, in some local authorities, when they're under pressure budget-wise, uh, cuts to the number of ASN support teachers and all the rest of it uh, is the easy target uh, for cuts. So, is there a need now to ring fence resources in local authority budgets for ASN? Because, by definition, uh, these uh, pupils require a minimal level of resources to be spent on them to be able to um, have any chance uh, of having a successful school career. Okay, um, I'll go to Miss Curry first, and then to Miss King on that. Okay, thank you um, for that. Um, I think uh, there's two parts to your question. One is about the widening the definition um, of ESN. Um, I think so that, we the point is so that we can target the most needed. Um, and um, the, is it um, do we need to ring fence um, resources? Some of that is beyond um, Education Scotland's um, uh, uh, um, Duty. So I'll I'll, I'll, call, I'll try and comment um, on the definition of ESN to start with. I think the definition of ESN is already extremely broad, um, and our approach within Education Scotland would be um, to say let's start um, with the universal offer. Um, and certainly, that as was mentioned previously, I think um, the advisory group um, has talked about universal. Um, and our approach would be to strengthen that universal approach um, so that we capture the needs of all children. And it goes back to an original answer that I gave, which is let's start with the needs of the individual child within the classroom. And we need to meet the needs of all children, not just those um, that um, we identify as having this label of additional support needs. I don't think it's helpful to have labels, and I don't think it's helpful to have that kind of deficit model. I think we need to start from what is this child's needs and how do we meet those needs um, within this setting? And if we can't meet it within this setting, what do we need to do in order to supplement that and address um, that shortfall um, in meeting that child's needs? And we've already talked about the range of things we can do in relation to that. Um, if we start from building and strengthening the universal offer, and I mean by that the teaching, the, the quality of teaching and learning and pedagogy, because that's at the crux of um, some of the issues that have been raised previously. Because if we don't have that right, then we create barriers to learning and we create more additional support needs that we can't meet. So Education Scotland uh, very um, uh, firmly believe um, um, in supporting that universal offer, and we've been doing a lot of work in that area um, around refreshing curriculum for excellence um, uh, context um, and looking again at how we make that work um, within the current thinking around um, teaching and learning um, and our experiences um, of COVID. We've also um, tried to strengthen um, schools' ability to evaluate that universal offer through developing a tool called Getting It Right for All Learners. But that's um, <clears throat> that's to try and reinforce um, the 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 need to look at leadership, curriculum, teaching, and learning and assessment. Um, because we need to get that right in order to prevent those barriers and, to, and thereby producing more children with additional support needs. So I know I'm labouring that point, but I think it's absolutely critical in some of the discussions that we've been having. So I don't think we need to look at broadening the definition of ESA. I think we need to look at it within that universal offer. In terms of targeting the most needy, there are systems and processes and, and, um, that are already um, um, in, system, in education context, which allows us to identify the most needy. Uh, and in that, that, we've talked about the code of practice, we've talked about the child's plan, um, which looks at that health and wellbeing aspect um, of children's development. So we're able to identify the most needy, um, and in identifying um, those children, again, we look at that broader multi-agency um, approach to ensuring that those most needy children um, have their needs met, but within the least restrictive environment for them. And I think that's an important concept as well. Um, in relation to, um, is it easy to cut additional support needs resources, and therefore do we need to ring fence? Um, 
I don't think it is easy to cut um, resources in that area because it's a demand-driven uh, budget. But there is also legislation there that places uh, requirements on education authorities to meet the needs of those children identified as having significant needs. So therefore, um, uh, authorities are then led into um, uh, break, breaking the law um, if they don't have the resources that enables them to actually meet those needs and to meet the requirements uh, under the law. So um, I don't. I haven't found necessarily in, in schools and authorities that I've been involved in as an inspector, inspecting authorities, etc., um, that cuts in those areas are necessarily targeted more than cuts in other areas. Um, and that would be more of a personal um, insight, um, given the experience that I have um, uh, in relation to inspection. Thank you. Okay, Ms. King. Um, thank you. And I don't know that I have very much more to to, to add to, um, to what Laura Ann said. I mean, I I would agree that you know the additional support, the definition of additional support for learning is is pretty broad and inclusive already. Um, uh, you know how, how we um, uh, you know you, uh, interpret that, if you like. Um, again, there's there's, there's a, a good guide there in terms of the code of practice and the factors that give rise to additional support needs. Um, I would entirely agree with what she said with regard to, um, you know, the you know, shifting the focus or retaining the focus rather on um, the strength of our universal provision, um, and it will again re uh, vary in terms of some of the um, the demographics as we've referred to before. The authority I work for in Dundee, um, we have had to take a very inclusive approach to to many of our particularly our primary one, primary two classrooms with regard to children's. Um, social and communication and language development. If we had taken a targeted approach to that, um, it would have been a, an entirely inefficient way of being able to support those children as they move into primary one, because so many children, partly related to poverty, come into school with um, you know significant gaps in their in their um, their uh, their language and communication development. So we have had to take a universal approach, in part supported through the Scottish Achievement Challenge um, um, uh, funding and framework, but. Um, so I, I would agree. I don't think we. Um, uh, it, it's how we how we guide, if you like, um, and support um, um, those working within the additional support for learning framework to make better use of the um, the, the criteria that are there. Um, and with regard to um, the um, the it, our, our additional support needs um, um, easy targets, um, I, I would. Um, support um, the the answer that that Laura Ann gave, and certainly in relation to um, you know my own experience as a manager, that um, we absolutely have to ensure that we're meeting the requirements of the legislation, um, and we have to make sure that we've got a workforce that is there um, along with other resources. It's not just people remember um, to be able to support young children's uh, children, young people's additional support needs, um, and it should it should not be um, uh, seen as a as as an easy as an easy target. And if in moving forward and, and in um, addressing the recommendations of um, Angela Morgan's review, um, all nine of them again, they, they can't be seen in isolation. Um, and, and in doing so, local authorities have to be mindful that they have a responsibility um, to implement those recommendations um, along with um, the others who are who are um, uh, named in the, the report and the subsequent action plan. And part of that is that if with that increasing um, Identification, if you like, and um, percentage that we have um, as far as children with additional support needs is concerned, that in itself says that we have to take a more inclusive and universal approach. Mr. Neil, are you content to move on? Yeah, given the time constraints, I'll let other people come in now, convener. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just just before we move on, if I could ask uh, an additional question. Um, we've had a lot of questions today around the nature of support, about funding, about um, what constitutes support in, in different local authority areas. But part of the, the, the difficulty I, I would suggest for the committee in understanding this is, is we know what a teacher is. We know what a traditional support for learning teacher is because it's clearly defined, and there are rules around you know class numbers and associated with that. But across different local authority areas. A classroom assistant can be defined as very many different things, and an additional support staff member in some authorities will be required to have specialist training, and others won't be. 
um, if we're talking about you know the, a, a shift change in how we approach this, is part of that a, a commonality of definition across local authorities? And uh, have you had any discussions with COSLA about how that might be achieved? Um, and I'll go to um, Ms Curry first. Yeah, I think that's an, uh, an interesting insight, um, because yes, we, we we do know what a teacher is and, and does. Um, PSAs um, are very um, variable and deployed very variably um, across um, authorities, and I think um, I'm hoping that the um, the working group around uh, arising from Angela Morgan's review will will look at what do we mean by a PSA and what is the expectations of what that PSA. Um, will do um, in an inclusive context. Um, we have in Education Scotland we have a representative um, on that, that group. I think it will be helpful um, to define some of those um, roles um, in order to get more consistency um, and, and to um, perhaps to raise expectations um, of what PSAs can offer, because I've seen some really good examples and good practice of PSAs uh, supporting children with additional support needs with very targeted interventions, and it works um, really well and improves outcomes for those children. Um, doing things that you can't do in a classroom when a child maybe in, uh, you know, gets to primary six and they're still um, trying to um, to remember the, the initial letter sounds of words, so you, you can't really do that in a classroom setting. So the PSA has been is able to do that rehearsal and, and practice and, um, uh, without embarrassing a, a, an older child and um, going over um, um, interventions that would be done in primary one. But um, I'm probably going into too much detail about PSAs, but I do think that your general point about defining what they can do and where they're um, most effective. Um, and if we can draw um, on, some, on our inspection evidence to inform some of that, but also on other people's views um, and experience um, of, um, of how they assist children with additional support needs and the important role that they have as that significant adult, because they're con particularly um, you know, with children who have had adverse childhood experiences, sometimes care experienced children. They are the people that those children confide in, um, uh, sometimes more than they would in, um, with others. So um, that is a fairly long answer, but I wanted just to, to make some comments about PSAs because I think they are so important um, in, in how we deliver and support children with additional support needs. In terms of some of the other roles, um, again, I think um, a debate around that would be helpful, so that we're all um, starting from the same. Um, um, page um, and I also I think it will be important for parents because sometimes parents um, um, don't understand what the roles are of, of different professionals and I do know that um, professional groups themselves obviously try to define what their role is and what they do. Examples of that are educational psychologists um, who are frequently um, you know, found by sometimes parents will say, "Well, we can't get to an educational psychologist." And when we did see them, they didn't they didn't work with our child. What they did is they went into the class and they observed, etc. So I think yes, to your general point, I think it would be helpful to have um, better definitions of what professionals provide, and some of that will have to be done within the context of local um, authorities because they operate differently. Miss King. Answer, yeah. Thank you. Ms King, would you like to come in on that point? And then I'll move to um, Mr Greer. Yes, um, I think it's um, it's an area that um, both ADES and our sort of um, partner organisation, ASLO, um, um, have a, a, a fairly regular focus on. Um, and um, I won't um, repeat what um, Laura Ann said. I would agree with um, everything that she has said. Um, I think that the, the the working group, the national working group, that's going to um, be addressing a number of those issues will be certainly a, um, produce some interesting work. I think that um, we shouldn't lose sight of um, there's a reference in Angela Morgan's report to um, um, a considerable amount of work that took place, albeit um, in um, in England and Wales, but it, nevertheless it's a fairly strong body of research and evidence that's referred to as making the best use of teaching assistance. It's on the Education Endowment Fund. Um, website, and um, that's research that's gone back over many years, um, and that um, actually, irrespective of what we name, if you like, the the, the job title, um, what's important is, um, and there are seven recommendations. There is um, the the um, 
the deployment, for want of a better word, um, um, of those staff, and in particular the partnership and the role that they have with class teachers. Um, what some of that research found was that, um, hence making the best use of, is that we have an assumption that by having um, a pupil support assistant or um, additional support needs assistant there, that that, that that makes the difference. And um, the evidence would tell us that um, in and of itself it doesn't, and it doesn't necessarily improve children's attainment. And in some circumstances, it can actually become a barrier to a child's inclusion and participation if there's a risk that the adult then becomes the person who does the support and the work for the child, for example, or that children and other children are less likely to form friendships because there is literally another adult sitting there with that child. So it's it's complex and it's sophisticated. Um, and that doesn't in any way um, minimise um, the, the incredible role that many of our um, support staff, PSAs, play. Um, and um, one of the areas that I think that, again, um, the research would tell us, and we, we've certainly looked at it in a number of our local authorities, is that we need to define better leadership roles for those staff. Um, they have a vast wealth of experience. I think that um, while, yeah, qualifications are, um, are, um, are welcome, they're only one form of adult learning. Um, and um, what can be equally powerful is um, accredited um, work-based learning, which um, can sometimes be easier to achieve. Um, uh, staff who are pupil support assistants don't necessarily always have the, um, the, the, the time um, out with their working lives um, to take part in, um, in, in more formal learning. Um, some authorities do have arrangements with colleges um, in terms of recruiting their um, supply of workforce um, um, from those who have undertaken um, a, a, a certain level of qualification, if you like. But as, as um, Kim, you implied with regard to teachers, that's just the start sometimes um, of, um, of, of someone's professional learning journey. And um, again, vast amount of evidence to say that work-based learning and the way in which um, we value and deploy our support staff, support staff is fundamentally important to the difference that they will make um, for children and young people in their, um, in their lives, um, particularly as we move into adult life. Um, while there are, will always be some young people who will require assistance as they um, go into adult life for their personal care and, um, and other aspects, Many young people move into adult life, and and that other adult who isn't there. So we, we have to work towards supporting young children in many cases to become independent of that support. Um, and again, a lot of the research that came out of making the best use of teaching assistance identified ways in which that can happen. So um, there's 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 a lot that we can learn and, and move on. But I think yes, having some um, some commonality, if you like, in terms of a framework. Um, there are there, there are national frameworks in other in our, other parts of the UK um, that we could we could learn from that, and I, I would be hopeful that the the work of the steering group will look to address that. But there will always be some individual differences again because of just differences between authorities in terms of their structures. But a common framework would be hugely helpful. Thank you very much. Um, can I move to questions from Mr. Greer, and then. A final member wanted to announce Mr Johnson. If anyone else does want in, could you please put an R in the chat? We'll go to Mr Greer first. Thank you, Convener. I'd like to return to the discussion we had in the previous session around coordinated support plans um, and ask if there's been any review of the statutory guidance for CSPs since that was first produced. I'm aware there have been, been at least one instance of a legal case resulting in case law uh, in relation to the, the statutory guidance. But has there been any review uh, by Education Scotland, or are, are you aware of the review, if it was perhaps led by the, the Learning Directorate, of that guidance and whether whether it's adequate or, or not, whether it fulfils the function it's designed for? Okay, I go to Ms. Curry first. Thank you. Um, as far as I'm aware, there has been no review um, of CSPs um, and, and, and in relation to the statutory guidance. Um, again, um, that that has been amended, um, as you know, um, the ASL Act was amended, um, but CSPs are still very clearly defined um, and within um, that that guidance. What is happening, as you will be aware, is, is that through the implementation group of, um, of Angela Morgan's review, um, CSPs um, will 
be um, reviewed again, not in relation to whether they should exist, but um, in a much broader than that, and um, how are they working, um, and um, how can we make that better? Um, because no doubt um, there are areas within uh, people's understanding or misunderstanding of what CSPs are for that needs to be better defined. There's also work that needs to be done, which Education Scotland were involved in um, prior to COVID, to look at um, the um, the statutory guidance in relation to um, staged intervention and the opening of CSPs and how that um, is uh, implemented within authorities, because that can be quite different. Um, and that concept of what is significant can also be interpreted very loosely in some cases. Um, uh, and that needs to be um, given due regard. So, I, uh, I, as part of that group, I'll be in that group, and um, I'll certainly be asking those questions. The other bit that needs further clarity in relation to CSPs is the difference between the CSP and the GIRFET um, Child's Plan, because that is also causing confusion in the system. And again, some work prior to COVID that had to be halted um, was looking at that, um, that uh, trying to provide greater clarity and trying to make the links between the levels within um, um, the um, Child's Plan that would necessitate additionality in terms of intervention. And Support with the stages that exist within the court, um, determining whether or not a coordinated support plan um, requires to be opened. So, bringing those two bits together to provide clarity for the system, um, and that's what Education Scotland have been involved in with the Scottish Government, and will be taken forward into um, the CSP um, working group um, that comprises of a range um, of stakeholders. So, I would hope that some of the issues that we know exist around um, that decision-making process. Um, are addressed um, within that group. Thank you, um, Ms. King. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I, I would probably just add to um, uh, what Laura has said. I mean, obviously there will be um, a review in terms of the implementation aspect of CSPs with the with the with the group. Um, and again, Ades has a representative on that group. Um, I think that some of the differences that have arisen. Um, it's it's no surprise, I suppose, that with the introduction of um, uh, GERFEC, and particularly when the um, in the early stages of 2014, when the um, the the act and the bill were being considered, that we saw um, a considerable rise in the number of um, child's plans or children with child's plans, and and what appear to be um, and it's only a correlation, um, a decline in the number of CSPs, and I I think that that there's a, a an implementation issue there in terms of um, a planning, a purpose for planning. So we were um, that um, the, the the introduction of um, uh, um, many aspects of GERFEC had a a, a, a big um, uh, focus, if you like, in all of our local authorities in terms of the the, the assessment of children's well-being, um, how we met those outcomes, um, and I think that there was a um, that 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 became a focus. I th I don't think that children's additional support needs. Um, were were um, ignored or discounted or diverted in that process, but I think therefore the planning formats um, were to some extent. Um, and the the task I think uh, one of the tasks for the review group is to look at how we can have better alignment. Um, the CSP is absolutely, as everyone um, here knows, it's a um, uh, sits within its own legislation, um, the ASL legislation. It's um, it, it, without doubt, it has a level of administration um, and, and, and bureaucracy, if you like, um, that um, a child's plan doesn't have. Um, I disagree with the comment I think that was made in the, in the um, previous panel that um, local authorities don't open the coordinate support plans because it's gatekeeping and it's, um, it's preventing resources. I fundamentally disagree with that, and that's not my experience and the members that I um, work with in the ADES network. Um, Another point I think that you know the CSP review group we should consider is, and we don't again. I'm going to refer back to outcomes, but we don't really have any evidence to know um, what planning format actually makes a difference to a child's progression and development. Do, 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 is a CSP any better at doing that than a child's plan? Um, and those are the questions that I think that we have to consider. So um, I think the the review that did take place, obviously, or the amendment rather than the ASL Act. 
um, laterally, I think it was the 2009 revision, um, which gave greater um, emphasis, if you like, to um, uh, looked after um, children and young people with regard to their rights to a coordinated support plan, um, I think um, was helpful. I think, um, again, it requires, though, um, very careful um, and considered approaches to planning, because we do not want it to become an overly complicated experience for children and young people. And we have done some work um, in my local authority around um, what is it that parents want from an experience of um, assessment and planning, and a plan that they can understand and they can take forward. And the, 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 the simpler, the better, is the, is the, is the answer uh, that we found. Um, and that um, we have to bear that in mind as well, that plans that become, can become overly complicated um, and are not um, coordinated with parents and families won't necessarily achieve the outcomes that, that we want. So um, that is probably, again, a slightly broader answer to the question that you asked, but I hope that helps in some ways. Mr Greer? Thank you. Um, and I have no doubt that you are correct, Ms. King, that what parents in particular want is, is a plan that is simple and, and easy to understand. Um, I have now sat on this committee for five years, and we have looked at additional support needs quite consistently throughout that. And The other key bit of feedback that we get that sits alongside that, because that is absolutely what we have heard, is that they want a plan that gives them some recourse, that gives them an ability to challenge what they perceive to be a lack of support. And That is where CSPs are unique, because of the statutory underpinning of them, though I accept that there is a wider discussion that needs to be had about do CSPs fulfil the function they need? What what do the other plans uh, do that, that perhaps can be drawn into the CSP process? Uh, I have just got one follow-up um, question uh, for, for Ms Currier. Um, you, you mentioned a couple of bits of work that had been either ongoing or, or that had been started pre-pandemic and, and that were halted. Is all of that being rolled into the CSP review that is about to begin? Is there anything that is going to sit outside that and continue? It would just be really useful for us to know how what sounds like very useful work that was unfortunately halted will not be lost, and, and we will make sure it either carries on through the review or it simply is restarted in, in a separate uh, pathway. Um, thank you for, for asking that. Um, yes, it will be picked up um, by the um, CSP implementation group. They, they have their meeting in February um, next week, I think that is, um, and they are going to be working on the terms of reference. Um, but the work won't be lost because it was quite a significant input and it was informed um, um, by. Um, uh, by ourselves, the Scottish Government, but also um, um, uh, an, uh, an employee from um, Perth and Coonross who is immersed and steeped in additional support needs. Um, so uh, the other bit, just picking up on what Jennifer said, the other important bit within that work um, that was taken forward was it was to try and simplify things um, and to make it. Um, um, accessible to parents um, and to professionals because it has become very, very complex. That whole landscape of planning. So yes, I, I will certainly be championing the work that had been done before and ensuring that it is embedded. And I've already had some of those discussions um, with um, the Scottish Government person who's leading that group, and I'm sure Jennifer will be supporting that as well. So yes, and it's good to hear that you're um, um, keen for that um, to go ahead and, and, and to be for us to be thinking about. Issues. Yeah, thanks. We're really heading up against time at the moment. Um, Mr. Greer, are you happy for me to move to final questions for Mr. Johnson? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Johnson? Uh, yes, I, I, I'm afraid I, I just need to begin by uh, challenging something that Jennifer King said uh, earlier in the, in the session. And while I completely agree with her wider point about the need to look at the, the broader common strands that uh, can uh, occur with someone has a diagnosis of ADHD or with uh, ASD, I, I really have to ask her not to use uh, the term label. Uh, I would also need to ask her to acknowledge the point that when someone has a diagnosis, it's not just useful for them and their parents, but it should directly inform teaching practice and the support that's provided to the individual child. And I, I know she wasn't quite uh, meaning that, but I would just ask her to, to, to just bear those things in mind uh, in the future. But I guess, you know, as we're coming to the end, I, I was wanting to ask some specific questions, but I, I, I will just put one broad one. 
you know, I'm sitting here listening to, to our two panellists and I find it slightly difficult to reconcile their contributions with both our previous panel and indeed in some ways to the Morgan Review itself. It, you know, I, I, I completely accept that, that there's an awful lot of uh, good intention, there's an awful lot of work in this area, uh, but if you read the Morgan Review, you know, three key things really stand out to me. First of all, is that, that, that teachers, while well-intentioned, don't necessarily have the required practice in, in place, uh, the right approach. That was loud and clear in the report. Secondly, uh, that, 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 that there aren't necessarily the right supports in place for those teachers, be that uh, you know, additional uh, resource or training. And again, that's something that the committee heard loud and clear the last time we took evidence on that, that the complete paucity of uh, continuous professional development. And, and, and finally, that parents often have to fight in order to get the support that they require. And, and I just wonder, you, you, could the panelists just uh, reflect on whether or not actually what we need is rather than a, a sort of a, a, an incremental progression on, on, on the approach that we have right now, is really quite a fundamental sea change in approach? And if so, what will bring that sea change about? Yeah, if I could go to Ms King first of all, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I'll probably just pick up on um, Mr Johnson's point about um, the reference um, I made to labelling, and um, I apologise in terms of how that was um, perceived. And it's not. I think the general, more general point I was trying to make is that the um, and the categorisation which um, and um, Angela. Um, Morgan referred to is that, that that perhaps is where it's unhelpful in terms of its um, uh, complexity that it may add to in terms of um, how teachers are perceived. I don't in any way minimise um, you know um, the the need to understand the specific um, aspects of what it means to um, have autism or to um, have ADHD. Far from it. Um, so I um, but I accept the point that you made in terms of. Um, uh, uh, how, how I refer to it. Um, as far as um, the other, I suppose your, your question was, um, does there need to be a fundamental change um, <clears throat> um, in relation to um, at least the, 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 the three points that you made around parents training and teachers? Um, and I think that uh, and Angela Morgan's report um, absolutely gave us a, um, a, a steer towards that in terms of the nine recommendations that, um, that she made, all of which are interconnected. Um, and, um, and the very first point that she makes at the start of the report is in relation to the need to, to refresh and to create a new vision, um, which all of the key, st st key stakeholders, including parents, um, uh, local authorities, um, um, Education Scotland and government, um, all need to contribute to. So um, that, that gives us, um, without any doubt in my mind, um, uh, a platform, if you like, or a, um, a, 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 um, the initiative to um, to reflect on that, but it must be tied in with, um, um, and I know I've mentioned this several times, but um, it must be tied in with what outcomes we want for um, children and young people in an inclusive um, society as they as they become adults. Um, it's it's not just for the length of time that they are children and young people. Um, so I think that um, the 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 I would hope that I mean, if if um, the um, the panel have seen the uh, the committee have seen the um, action plan, um, there are um, a number of um, um, all of the recommendations have um, actions against them, and as like the additional support for learning implementation group, which Laura Ann and I are both members of, um, have already undertaken some considerable work in looking at what those outcomes and how they'll be measured will be taken forward. Obviously, under the um, uh, the chair of um, Jan Savage. So um, yes, I think it's a. I think Angel Angela's report was was hugely welcome, um, um, and Ades um, accepted all of the recommendations in it. Um, and I think we start from um, a refresh of the vision of what it is that we want to and should achieve, um, but w without losing sight, as I say, that there are there are nine interrelated recommendations there, and they're all of equal importance. Thank you, uh, Miss King. Oh, sorry, Miss King. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, 
I am passionate um, about inclusion and about additional support needs. I've worked in the area for 35 years as an educational psychologist, as a manager of services. Um, and I, some of the issues that you've raised are exactly the same issues that I came across when I started out in my career, and that's disappointing. Um, however, there, are me, there is a lot of progress that we've made. Um, um, and that gives me hope that we can continue to actually develop um, this new vision that we have. Or maybe it's not even a new vision, but a refreshed vision. A refreshed vision that gives clarity about the journey we need to be on in terms of how we implement the aspirations of the um, legislation um, and the guidance that accompanies the legislation. Because nobody is disagreeing that that's not right and correct and it's built um, in, in, uh, in a social justice context. Um, but yes, we have work to do um, in terms of professional learning. There's lots of professional learning that Education Scotland provide. Um, I put that onto the briefing note, and I'm not going to go through it because I know that we're um, really pushed for time. But I think part of the issue is um, you, know, you can provide professional learning, but you can't guarantee that people will necessarily take it on or on board or will actually use it appropriately or effectively. So that's where it's a bigger picture around how do we provide professional learning. It can't just be courses. It has to be about engaging with um, teachers and having um, better conversations um, around what the challenges are for meeting the needs of the diverse range of children with additional support needs. Um, and to um, and to achieve what is the right of every child, which is to have you know, an excellent education. Um, um, and that's enshrined um, in, in, in all of our um, direction of travel within Scotland. So I think professional learning, we need to look at it um, um, carefully um, and identify what teachers are asking for, because it's obviously not meeting what some of the teachers um, think that they need. So that's, again, about hearts and minds sometimes discussion. I think communication is central to this. So I actually think, yes, one of the things I would say that I've experienced all through my um, journey within additional support needs is parents saying I've had to fight for everything. I worked in early um, in what we call preschool at that time, children and children with learning difficulties, and parents would say, you know, this has not been easy. Um, so there is something about communication, um, and again, I think we've improved on that, um, and we have systems and processes in place. We have third sector organisations that are there to help, um, but we need to be able to publicise them more. We need to make sure that parents are getting access to those and um, to that um, um, objective advice. Um, and in relation to a sea change, I think maybe that touches on what Angela Morgan was referring to, where we have to think again about what is inclusion within our current context. And I think COVID has really helped us um, to, to take forward our thinking in relation to that, because all children have experienced uh, disadvantage as a result of um, COVID, whether that's in terms of mental health, um, in, in terms of other issues that have been happening in their lives. Um, it gives us a platform, again, to look at the inclusion agenda within that universal um, context. So. Thank you. I hope that answers some of your question, and I look forward to actually taking forward some of those recommendations that Angela has made. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm afraid I do have to call the panel to close at that point. Uh, thank you to Ms King and Ms Curry for their attendance this morning. I will now suspend for five minutes to allow members to move to private session in Microsoft Teams. Thank you very much.